Your Grace, several members of the Faith Militant have been permitted entry to the Red Keep. Have been permitted. That's rather a tortured way of putting it. They demand to see you, Your Grace. Who permitted them inside the Red Keep? The King is aware of their presence. He is, Your Grace. He's currently in his chambers at prayer. Holiness the High Septon wishes to speak with you at the Great Sept of Baelor. His Holiness the High Septon is welcome to see me here in the Red Keep. Your Grace, this is not a request. It is a request, Cousin Lancel. You are asking me for something I'm refusing. The High Septon commands you. Are you sure you want to refuse him? He promised me I could stay in the Red Keep. Until my trial. You made no such promises. If you refuse to come of your own free Get will. Out. Move aside, sir. Order your man to step aside, or there will be violence. Tell His High Holiness he's always welcome to visit. If a nation wants to raise its fertility rate and grow the country without immigration, it's simple. You win a war, <laughs> right? preferably with a strong competitor. But not in the modern sense where war is kind of like more of a, this mass psychosis than how we... Think of these hordes of men, right, marching across continents like we read about in the Bible and in the Iliad. Perhaps you could argue it's it's the same effect, but, you know, with no shots fired. Because in an, an aristocratic society, in the truest sense of that, the best fighter will go out and battle with his rival king, right? <laughs> That's not happening. Joe Biden isn't, <laughs> isn't going to don the armor, and he's not going to go battle for the eternal glory of Jupiter, <laughs> Right in an in a, in a Christ, an aristocratic world, Cleos or the glory on the battlefield it reigns supreme. Jupiter or Zeus thinks it's good to go out and <laughs> fight your rivals. Apparently, it's 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 good. In the Iliad, it's good. He loves no one more than Achilles and Agamemnon. No matter how you could argue it, right? Just the effect or the end result of it is that they're the ones who get the most Cleos, right? In the Iliad, and Cleos is what starts the kind of the whole feud between Achilles and Agamemnon, where, of course, Briseis is taken from Achilles, and, and thus the whole point of fighting in the war, or being a soldier in general, you know, to gain a, a claim from fighting, is, and also, but it's not just that, it's to get money, it's to get girls, and it's to get power, right? People don't just necessarily join the military just to, to kill people, they, they do it for other things, even if it's subconsciously, right? Because think about Julius Caesar and his nephew, Augustus Caesar, right? These ultimate wills to power using the battlefield as the resume builder. And Jeff Bezos would probably be, <laughs> be most be benevolent to send us into the broad fields and not into these huge warehouses to ship plastic widgets across the country. It's essentially, what's wrong with today is that we don't go to war in the real sense. How... How most people imagine, right? <laughs> go out, kill a bunch of people in the crazed frenzy, and then you go home and get like this 1950s family. That's not going to happen. They're not going to allow you to get that Kleos, right? The battlefield is mostly mercantile. So 
you can't you shouldn't quit your job over this partisan thing right that's the identifier to get you get you out of this system right especially some of these heroic jobs like pilots cops soldiers doctors nurses etc don't you shouldn't quit right you should the only way you should quit is if you're offered a better job these are some of the only jobs that allow people to get cleos today in fact right in fact just do the opposite of what some of these people tell you right you should join the military if not just for the benefits right the odds are you're not going to go die in some war you should also go to college right even if it's a liberal arts just go to college essentially europeans can't become primitive yokels right <laughs> because well U europeans in my opinion are, are are known for their heroism ingenuity sophistication class it's not living in a shack with no electricity there's no kleos in that you're you're better off doing anything really that involves getting involved in society or some kind of city life or civilization no matter how bad a conservative tells you it is right it's easier said than done I, for everyone understands that i mean you could literally hurl yourself off buildings as a sport and, ne <laughs> and nearly kill yourself and then you require years of re rehabilitation until the next time you're healed up enough Years later, you can hurl yourself off a building again, right? And you start the cycle again. That's your sport, and right. And then in the process, you'll probably meet like a, a nurse or something, and then you're gonna marry the nurse when because she's gonna heal you up, right? And she she didn't quit her job because of some dumb partisan psychosis, right? And, and she'll think you're interesting because of Cleos, right? So we live in a democracy. Our society wants us to be fat. Dem democracy is living off the fat of the land as, lo as long as possible. So the stock market needs to go up, and that happens through people going to work and pe paying into 401ks and mutual funds and retirement funds and pension funds, etc. Our, 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 our elite understands you, the individual, as cattle. That needs to be kept alive, and you need to be corralled into a herd. You need to be pacified into this kind of like you know, two-party politics, and then you're going to be milked for your, for your money. And, of course, you're going to be fat, right? They want you to consume. The government isn't trying to wipe everyone out. It's trying its hardest to keep a fat and sickly population alive. And it's scrambling to cope with its failures, right? It copes by blaming the various, the very people, people capable of maintaining and prog progressing technology to a point to, to sustain a growing population. Anyone who's going to be a legitimate threat and that you could possibly outdo uh, you know like a corporate slave or even outdo kind of a corporation in general right you could form your own own one through some kind of product in a market you're going to be destroyed by that over a larger market right the stock market or just private equity in general and christianity is kind of <laughs> what hurts the major herder in the united states right it's judeo -Christ christianity is what hurts people it's for slaves it's about bowing out and just submitting we aren't ruled by aristocrats nobody's fighting it out joe, <laughs> joe biden is not fighting it out Pl plutocrats and technocrats run the united states right so we are run by hercules and jacob but anyways cleos is important today still but it was most important in in the past right in these aristocratic societies like in the bible the hebrew bible along with the iliad where it's most famous <clears throat> So from the Bible in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 49, Jacob blesses his 12 sons with Reuben being the first son to be blessed. And following Reuben is the blessings for the two sons, Simeon and Levi, where Levi is the patriarch of the Levi tribe, uh, the priestly class of the Israelites. And Aaron and Moses are Levites. I argue that Aaron the Levite is represented by Nestor in Homer's Iliad and Agamemnon as the Levite Moses. And if we wanted if we wanted to take it further, I would say Athena represents the tribe of Levites, or at least Levi as we know from the book of Genesis. So then as a result of that equation, making that kind of saying that they're equal, we can say that S Simeon is analogous to Ares. Uh, you know, how we know the pop how we know the god of war popular in the Iliad. So Athena is an analogous to the Levites and Ares is to the tribe of Simeon. So if one reads Genesis 34, 
you can relate it to the Greek myths, but also, you know, popular culture to really bring it to life. Because with the Hebrew myths, you kind of have to have a sense of, you kind of have to make sense of it through the media. Because, well, I don't speak Hebrew. Most people don't speak Hebrew. So it's like, well, where do you go to where the Hebrew myths are used as inspiration? Well, it's Hollywood. It's Netflix. It's all. It's HBO. It's the media. But it's also other forms too. But if you want to visualize it, yes, it's like in movies is the best. So reading from Genesis 34, Dina and the Shechemites. Now Dina, the daughter Leah, had born to Jacob, went out to visit the woman of the land. When Shechem, son of Homor, the Hivite, the ruler of that area, saw her, he took her and raped her. His heart was drawn to Dina, daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. And Shechem said to his father, Hamor, Get me this girl as my wife. When Jacob heard that his daughter Dina had been defiled, his sons were in the fields with his livestock, so he did nothing about it until they came home. Uh, so Dina, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, was raped by Shechem, where Shechem is the son of Hamor. And I, it's helpful to go through the etymologies or the of the names to get a better understanding for the rest of the myth. So Dina means the judge or govern, which one could say, yeah, she sounds kind of like Athena, and then we could, we should link her with the tribe of Dan, because Dina really is like Dan, where the tribe of Dan means to like judge or govern. And perhaps you could be right. Like I would, I would listen to somebody argue that the tribe of Dan is like Athena, but ultimately, though, I think. Dina is, or the tribe of Dan in general, represents Hera, the wife of Zeus, more than Athena, who, again, Athena I would, I would equate with the tribe of the Levites. <clears throat> Furthermore, I think looking at the series of uh, Game of Thrones on, on T or HBO and how they structured their myth, it would seem that Athena is analogous to the tribe of Levi. So if we take Circe to be like Athena and representative of the tribe of Levi. She would be the daughter of Lee and Hera, uh, the tribe of Dan, uh, would be the daughter of uh, by Bila, or however you say it. All in all, every Greek, Greek character or Hebrew character are, re are related somehow, right? Because the myths themselves are genealogical accounts, but there's enough distinctions to give names to them, right? The characters are distinct enough we can name them. You could also make the case for Circe being Ceres, the Roman equivalent of Demeter, right? But in reality, she's probably a mix of like Hera, Athena, and maybe even D Demeter some, somewhat too, where Circe is like a fierce woman, and she's also a queen, but she's incredibly, she's intelligent and shrewd, right? She's like Athena. Uh, uh, well, not a capable of violence herself, but nonetheless, right, she's powerful enough to unleash all kinds of destruction and human suffering. Uh, but she's also got a lot of kind of sex appeal, and she's also a mother herself, right? She's not a virgin like uh, Athena. So she could be like Demeter. Like I said, she's a very protective mother, and uh, she might be one of my favorite characters in the whole Game of Thrones, right? She's 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 kind of complex. <laughs> she's really complex, but she's also she's also a really good character. Athena, I gather, means atheist, or maybe literally a the theist right a theist it's it's somewhat of a misnomer now though right <laughs> much right like much how a pagan is called an atheist whereas judeo christianity or christianity comes much later right <laughs> christianity is not very old people have been worshiping other gods for like 7000 years and now these people are called some atheist or something like they don't <laughs> have any beliefs or belief structure Anyways, that's just kind of how society is. Also, today, atheism is another term for secularism, which obvious, obviously is a misrepresentation because there is a religious aspect to our society. <laughs> we, we have an atheist priestly, priestly class, right? They're just they're a priestly class of the state. They're not a theological-based law of society, right? We're not, we don't literally <laughs> believe in the Bible as, as our law. I think most, though, would recognize the orthodoxy of our society and what laws to obey. And even within the structure of the written law, there's even a spectrum of who can do what, when, and where. There's a class structure. And the Levites or Athena represent that medium, right? It's funny that Hebrews have the men do this, <laughs> the, priest, the priestless, priestess class, whereas the Greeks, uh, they have it as a feminine role, where the men are the soldiers, farmers, 
statesmen, sailors, and they're not the te temple priestess. Uh, opposing Athena is our brother Apollo, who is, we could say, is the apolitical deity, right? Where the oracle trumps all, not in law, but in principle, right? It's political if the truth has to fit your ideology. The oracle of Apollo is going to tell you what you need to hear. He's not going to tell you what you want. It's not political. But it's not a right to see the oracle. Somewhat of a, it's more, I think it's somewhat of a sacrament. You'll have to pay money. You'll have to make sacrifices. You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait for the oracle. Alexander didn't need to get permission from the oracle to invade Asia. But he knew he had to go there before he did. Shechem means so shoulder, or it's suggested to mean a burden, responsibility, or the motivation to get up in the morning. Something, something like that of a soldier. Uh, ultimately, we because ultimately we want to relate this to Athena and Ares. Uh, so a soldier has to be disciplined, but he also is not going to be a choir boy. <laughs> the Romans, the Romans and Alexander probably. They must have taken the Iliad quite literally and used it for tactics, right? These huge armies with, they would have three wings, right? You would have, or two wings, and you would have a center, and you would have several ro rows of men deep, and they would be shoulder to shoulder. You would fight with a, somewhat of a, a phalanx, although the Romans was a little different. The key, though, is not to be the weak link in the chain, right? It's a very organized and disciplined and standard, standardized way of fighting. So, and again, the men doing this fighting are going to be choir boys. <laughs> so, of course, like things like prostitution are just like our natural remedy for the soldiers when they're not fighting. But they're still at war, right? You're still in camp. Because like Athena is a virgin or Hera is the wife. She's at home and the soldier Ares is away from home is in camp. So it's kind of eugenic. To have women like Hera or Athena who can man the home front, do some light statesmanship, but also have the ability to keep house while the men are away from home, right? Athena is the one who can weave and teach crafts. And we know her from World War, World War II propaganda, but other forms too. And today, unfortunately, though, <laughs> today she's kind of taken on this kind of extreme version, I think, in my opinion. Conversely, Hebrew myth is one of constant wandering, right? There's no homestead in the sense that you're, you're, you're static. It's a nomadic life. So the men take all the positions. Like De Deuteronomy is a book to lead an army or at least a large contingent of men who know how to fight, right? <laughs> A.K.A. an army. So like Alexander would have – he would have – he could have written De Deuteronomy <laughs> in a sense. He could have written it. Next, so moving on, Dina or the tribe of Dan means to govern or judge where we can think of Hera as representing this role to judge. Finally, Hamor, the father of Shechem, means red or ruddy like a clay and originates from the verb to begin to flow slowly. So it could re it refer to the deposits of river like clay and other naturally occurring mineral deposits, but it could again refer to Aries in the color of red. And that, like Esau, the color of blood. So the verb hamar means to begin to f f slowly flow. It expresses, and it is associated with the color red, the color of the sunrise, metal that starts to melt, grapes that start to ripen, and so on. And the noun hamar uh, is like a tar, or, or refers to a reddish clay or natural cement. And the denominative verb means to smear with mud or asphalt. And the noun, homer, describes heaps of a near-liquid mass, particularly dead frogs or grains, and was also used as the largest standard unit of volume, equivalent to about one or two modern barrels. Right, and Most people know homer as the unit of measurement and, and kind of like in Genesis, but also up to Deuteronomy. And the noun, homer, homer means to heap or pile. So these are all kind of interesting when it comes to uh, our Aries, right? When we read the Iliad and they describe people as being like Aries, it's always people are being heaped up <laughs> onto the banks of like a river, right? And it's the blood is the color red. So interesting that Homer or the noun that describes the unit of measurement is seen in Genesis, right? But in particular, that of dead frogs, <laughs> which is famous from the ten, ten plagues of Egypt. 
So like Aries is like the clay on the banks of the Nile or perhaps in Mesopotamia with the Tigris and Euphrates. In addition, this could coincide with a large influx of frogs, right? That the frogs grow from tadpoles in the water. So if there's a flood, it's going to deposit red clay on the banks of a river, like a slow meandering river. And with the raised water level, you're also going to get more tadpoles laying eggs, right? You're going to get more frogs. Reading Genesis 34, Shechem defiles Dina while the boys, the sons of Jacob, are out in the fields. Again, this is like the men are out and about, and that is, right, the literally the state of things. So what is the state? Well, the state is how things are. Where is everything? Well, the army is here, the shepherds are here, and they're with this many sheep and flocks, and the navy is here or there with this many ships, and etc. right? The state is where, in a sense, the men are, but also where the women are, what the women are doing too, right? The women are at home keeping house, and they're also doing other light crafts, and are kind of patching everything up they're keeping everything running seamlessly right and they're also importantly taking care of the kids etc so leaving women alone though makes them vulnerable so if you go out to war if the men go out to war the women are just alone right so you have to build walls to keep them protected we all instantly recognize the symbol of a princess kept in the tower right and then there's a knight who has to come save her or there's like a evil knight who <laughs> kidnaps her Ares, Ares is the shield wall that protects the women. It makes the state secure for life to exist and thrive. Simeon is symbolized by the wall or citadel, the shield wall of Ares. Reading from the Homeric, the Homeric hymn to Ares, Ares, well, he's the Superman. He's the Hooperman Nantes, the He-Man, right? The cartoon He-Man. He's the police of the state, the one who can control the urge to kill needlessly and other kinds of crimes of passion. But once he's given permission from the state, he will organize himself into a killing machine along with thousands of other supermen and create this shield wall, right? He's going to stand shoulder to shoulder, and he's going to destroy anything in its path. In the Homeric hymn, Ares is also described as the shield bearer, Pharaspius, Pharaspis. Literally the one who bears the shield, where the the root aspis derives, I imagine, from aspilos to undefiled or unstained. So, right, Dina is defiled, so if you bear the shield, you're going to leave someone undefiled. You're going to protect them. Like in Game of Thrones, the army is known as the Unsullied. Uh, I'm not sure if Heraspis translates into English, but perhaps we can say it's like ferocity. It's the one he you bear the city, right? You're bearing the citadel, where, again, we can relate to the symbology of Simeon as the citadel, right? And if you bear the citadel, like, on your shield as, like, maybe a symbol, right, That then that is from Simeon or Ares, right? It's also the shield wall of the citadel or the city. Or in the Bible, it's the tabernacle, right, where the Levites reside. So let's read from Homer's Iliad, Iliad, book 2. Thus did he speak, and Agamemnon heeded his words. Thus did Nestor speak, and Agamemnon heeded his words. He at once sent the criers round to call the people in assembly, so they called them, and the people gathered thereon. The chiefs about the son of Atreus chose their men and marshaled them, while Athena went among them holding her priceless aegis that knows neither age nor death from it there waved a hundred tassels of pure gold all deftly woven in each one of them worth a hundred oxen with this she darted furiously everywhere among the hosts of the achaeans urging them forward and putting courage into the heart of each so that he might fight and do battle without ceasing thus war became sweeter in their eyes even then returning home in their ships, as when some great forest fire is raging upon a mountain top, and its light is seen afar, even so as they marched the gleam of their armor flashed up into the firmament of heaven. <clears throat> so if we read further, uh, or re if we read more, uh, uh, furthermore, in the hymn to, ha to Ares, he's, Ares is called the golden helmed, or he's the one who wears the golden helmet. So we're... Ares is usually easy to distinguish from other gods in statue form in that he's the soldier, so he's dressed as such. Always, he's always has a helmet, so we can tell who he is.
the word for golden helm is cruciopolix, where, of course, cruceo is gold, and palex can be helmet. But if I think if we look further, we can say it derives, or palex derives its root with clay, palos, and plaque or placos, right? This tablet or a flat surface. So comparing this to the Greek or the Hebrew name for Levite, well, well, for Levite, there is some debate over its meaning, but the most common et etymology for Levi is to join or adhere, probably like to weave and connect the smaller threads of the fiber into a cloth. So like Levi is the cloth or the woven fabric, fabric and Simeon is the table. And likewise, we can think of Ares as the table and Athena as the woven cloth. Uh, so if you read the Iliad, so Iliad book 14, Hera of the golden throne looked down as she stood upon a peak of Olympus and her, her heart was glad and at the sight of him who was at once her brother and her brother-in-law hurrying hither and thither amid the fighting. Then she turned her eyes to Zeus as he sat on the topmost crest of many fountain Ida and loathed him. She set herself to think how she might hoodwink him and in the end she, she deemed that it would be best for her to go to Ida and array herself in rich attire and hope that Zeus might be enamored of her and wish to embrace her. While he was thus engaged, a sweet and careless sleep might be made to steal over his eyes and senses. She went, therefore, to the room which her son Vulcan had made her, and the doors of which she had cunningly fastened by means of a secret key, so that no other god could open them. Here she entered and closed the doors behind her. She cleansed all the dirt from her fair body with ambrosia. Then she anointed herself with olive oil, ambrosial, very soft and scented, especially for herself. If it were so much as shaken in the bronze, if if, if it were... If it were so much as shaken in the bronze floored house of Zeus, the scent pervaded the universe of heaven and earth. With this she anointed her delicate skin, and then she plaited the fair ambrosial locks that flowed in a stream of golden tresses from her immortal head. She put on the wondrous robe which Athena had worked for her with consummate art, and had embroidered with manifold devices. She fastened it about her bosom with golden clasp, and she girdled herself with a girded herself with a girdle that had a hundred tassels, then she fastened her earrings three brilliant pendants that glistened most beautifully through her pierced lobes of her ears and through a love and through a lovely new veil over her head she bound her sandals onto her feet and when she had arrayed herself perfectly to her satisfaction she left the room and called venus to come inside and speak to her my dear child said she will you do what i'm going to ask of you or will you refuse me because you are angry at me being on the dene inside while you are on the trojan if you look at the etymology of Simeon, it means he who hears, and also su snub-nosed, where snub-nosed, I think, has a couple of meanings. The snub-nosed is the effect of, like, well, it's the golden helmet of Ares, right? It's this Greek Greek helmet of war, where it just, there's no nose jutting out, where the gold is the color of the clay, or it could be the sediment material on the walls, again, the citadel, but it could also represent the inner palace or the plaza or tabernacle that is walled off. Right. Snub nose could also describe the shape of the bank in a river, right? The steep bank of a slow moving river. Ares is also called the, the bronze armed or bronze covered, well, which means both the bronze armor that aristocrats wore to battle, but also the bonds to which the soldier was kept in. And most importantly, Ares is the one who listens, or is the one who hears. In the hymn to Ares, it's a prayer to Ares to hear you. It's like you talking <laughs> to your inner, your inner martial spirit. Everybody has a little bit of hot bloodedness to him. Everyone has a wants to destroy everything once in a while, but we need sometimes to calm down and not do something rash. That's going to end up in you <laughs> needlessly dying, right? Like after breaking the law, we see war is about not about who reacts quickest. Perhaps in some situations, but overall, it's a matter of capital, and it's a matter of will on the home front. How long can the home country sustain the war front? Can you draw more troops from the well? Could America even enact a draft today? This is the key. Ares is a good soldier, the guardian of the queen. If, he, if, if Ares can't control his primal urges or find a proper outlet for it, he obviously can't guard the princess or the queen, but it's ne necessary that we do protect it right if you have a queen that you do protect her if the men are going to go out and work and do battle 
right? The Superman are the one who can do this, and it's through the prayer to Ares, one to call out to Ares to hear you, right? And Athena is the one to make Ares hear. Here, she's like the drill sergeant who yells at the new recruit, or just in general, the type of communication needed in these huge formations of troops. You're going to have symbols, sounds, hand motions. All these are going to be used, I'd imagine. And the need to hear or recognize these kind of symbols and make some kind of semblance in your mind is important. Strategy can win the battle, or strategy is going to win the battle, and Athena is the one to provide that. It's not just this madness of blood, like it's just going to go hack everyone to bits. So, From the Iliad, Book 15. When he had heard this, Ares smote his two sturdy thighs with the flat of his hands and said in anger, Do not blame me, you gods that dwell in heaven. If I go to the ships and the Achaeans and avenge the death of my son, even though it end in my being struck by Zeus's lightning and lying in blood and dust among the corpses, as he spoke, he gave orders to yoke his horses, panic and rout, while he put on his armor. On this, Zeus would have been roused to still more, still more fierce and implacable enmity against the other immortals, had not Athena, armed for the safety of the gods, sprung from her seat and hurried outside. She tore the helmet from his head and the shield from his shoulders, and she took the bronze spear from his strong hand and set it on one side. Then she said to Ares, Madman, you are undone. You have ears that hear not. Or have you have lost all judgment and understanding? Have you not heard what Hera has said on coming straight from the presence of Olympian Zeus? Do you wish to go through all kinds of suffering before you are brought back sick and sorry to Olympus? Having, after having caused infinite mischief to all of us others, Zeus would instantly leave the Trojans and Achaeans to themselves. He would come to Olympus to punish us and would grip us one after another, guilty or not guilty. Therefore, lay aside your anger for the death of your son. Better men that have either been killed already or will have fall hereafter, and one cannot protect everyone's whole family. With this word, she took Ares back to his seat. So Athena berates Ares and asks him, Can you hear me? He calls him a madman. It's like the Homeric hymns. That Athena is the one who makes Ares listens or gives him orders, and that the soldier himself needs to be somewhat of a madman, right? <laughs> you can't have the choir boy. But he's got to have some willpower not to just lash out in every impulse. The burden of the soldier, the burden of the soldier's shoulders is intense, right? He's got to be able to, well, he's got to be able to handle death, basically, <laughs> the most brutal thing. Switching over to the Bible, in Genesis, the son of Leah is named uh, Simeon, right? So Simeon, the son of Leah and Jacob, he's named so because he's the one who hears. Again, like Athena, who yells at Ares and asks him if he hears. And make sure he does and brings him back safely to sit. And so he doesn't go out and do something crazy. The soldier is subject to a court or judgment of law. And that's the martial law. Athena, we can say, is the Levite. She brings the soldiers back safely. Athena is clear communication and strategy. And Ares, the bloodthirsty soldier, or the everyday man in the army. One uses the sword. The other uses laws and words. And Ares, or Simeon, right, Simeon, they need to hear. They're the ones who hear. So like how we imagine a drill instructor yells at a new recruit and they have to go, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> and in book, so in book four of the Iliad, Athena shoots down from the sky and everyone sees it as an omen, right? The soldier sees it. The mariner sees it. Everyone understands that Athena is going to give them some kind of omen or that she's going to reveal some kind of truth from Zeus, whether or not there's going to be peace or war. So let's read from the Iliad book four. My own, these three favorite cities, answered Hera, are Argos, Sparta, and Mycenae. Sack them whenever you may be displeased with them. I shall not defend them, and I shall not even care. Even if I did and tried to stay you, I should take nothing by it, for you are much stronger than I am. But I will not have my own work wasted. I too am a god and of the same race with yourself. I am Saturn's eldest daughter, and am an honorable not on only this ground, but also because I am your wife, and you are the king over the gods. Let it be a case that a give and take between us and the rest of the gods will follow our lead. Tell Athena to go and take part in the fight at once, and let her contrive that the Trojans shall be the first to break their oaths and set upon the Achaeans. The sire of gods and men heeded her words and said to Athena, Go at once into the Trojan and Achaean host and contrive that the Trojans shall be the first to break their oaths and set upon the Achaeans. This was what Athena Athena was already eager to do, so she, da she darted down from the topmost summits of Olympus. She shot through the sky as some brilliant meteor, which the son of scheming Saturn had sent as a sign to mariners or to some great army, and a fiery train of light falls in its wake. 
The Trojans and Achaeans were struck with awe as they beheld, and one would turn to his neighbor, saying, Either we shall again have war and din of combat, or Zeus, the lord of battle, will now make peace between us. Thus did they converse. Then Atita, Athena took the form of Laodicus, son of Antenor, and went through the ranks of the Trojans to find Pandarus, the redoubtable son of Lycon. She found him standing among the, stal among the stal stalwart heroes who had followed him from the banks of the Aesopus. So she went close up to him and said, Brave, brave son of Laocon, will you do as I tell you? If you dare send an arrow at Menelaus, you will honor and thank, thanks. You will win honor and thanks from all the Trojans and especially from Prince Alexandrus. He would be the first to requite you very handsomely if you would see Menelaus mount his funeral pyre, slain by an arrow from your hand. Take your home. Take your aim then and pray to Lycian Apollo, the famous archer. Vow that, vow that when you get home to your strong city of Zalea, you will offer a hecatomb of firstling lambs in his honor. So if we move ahead, we'll read from the Homeric hymn to Athena. So this is, of Pallas Athena, guardian of the city, I begin to sing. Dread is she, and with Ares she loves deeds of war, the sack of cities, and the shouting in the battle. It is she who saves the people as they go out in war. To go, they go out to war and come back. Right. So in the Iliad, in the Iliad, Agamemnon and Nestor serve in the role of Athena, where Agamemnon is the capital or the leader, is ultimately the one who draws the troops in and out of battle, and the one who draws the troop or draws the ships in and out of the water, whereas. In the Bible, it's Moses, the Levite, who na whose name means to draw out of the water. And in Deuteronomy, it said he's the only one who, who can give the troops permission to go out in battle. Right? It's Moses, ultimately. Uh, so from the Iliad, Book 2. Then surely the Argives would have returned after a fashion that was not fated. But Hera said to Athena, Alas, daughter of Aegis-bearing Zeus, unweariable, shall the Argives fly home to their own land over the broad sea and leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen? For whose so sake that so many of the Achaeans have died at Troy far from their homes? Go about at once among the hosts and speak fairly to them man by man that they draw not their ships into the sea. Athena was not slack to do her bidding. Down she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus, and in a moment she was at the ships of the Achaeans. There she found Odysseus, peer of Zeus in council, standing alone. He had not yet laid a hand upon his ship, for he was grieved and sorry, so he went she went down close up to him and said, Odysseus, noble son of Laertes, are you going to fling yourself into your ships and be off home to your own land in this way? Will you leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen, for whose sake so many of the Achaeans have died at Troy, Troy far from their homes? Go about at once among the hosts and speak fairly to them, man by man, that they draw not their ships into the sea. <clears throat> Nestor is the one who provides nostalgia and legitimacy similar to how we know TV and other forms of media today, right? You need, you need the press and media to be on your side if you're going to go to war. It's as much a psychological battle at home as it is in the actual battlefield to keep a nation at war. We know Moses suffers through the desert, and he relies on Aaron when he's away. Uh, away from the troops to keep them happy. He relies on Aaron. But ultimately, that's a failure, right? The the golden calf. They need the martial law or Deuteronomy to make it out. Likewise, in the Iliad, Agamemnon needs Achilles to kind of come back and fight for him. The Levite and the tribe of Simeon are inseparable. In equally so are Athena and Ares. In the catalog of ships in Book 2 of the Iliad, Homer says the Athenians were led by Menestheus, or the one who could marshal more troops than any other. Iliad, Book 2. And they had held the strong city of Athens, the people of great Erechtheus, who was born of the soil itself. But Zeus's daughter Athena fostered him and established him at Athens in her own rich sanctuary. There, year by year, the Athenian youths worship him with sacrifices of bulls and rams. These were commanded by Menestheus, son of Pateos, no man living could equal him in the marshalling of chariots and foot soldiers. Nestor could alone rival him, for he was older. With there came fifty ships. Going back to Genesis 34, 
after kind of sorting out all the etymology, I think the myths make more sense. So, like, Dina is like Hera, or she's the judge of Zeus, right? She comes out, and she brings, like, a conclusion, and then Athena has to go and actually communicate that down to the Simeon, or the Ares troops, right? The actual soldiers. So, Hera is kind of like the tribe of Dan figure, the judge, and the, there was a rape of Dina, right? The daughter of Jacob, right? This Dina, we can probably understand is <laughs> the, the tabernacle of the judgment itself, that you can't go up there, right? She's the one, Hera was the one who was covered in this, uh, this garment that was woven by Athena, right? The Levites. And, okay, so there's a rape of Dina, the daughter of Jacob is raped, and while the rape happens, the sons of Jacob, and while the rape happens, uh, the sons of Jacob are out, and as a result, they're called back in, right? They're drawn back in. So, like, Moses and the Levites, they're the ones that draw the troops in or draw them out. And the sons of Jacob are brought in from the field. So the first reaction of them is is the pure rage to exact revenge. But Jacob, he's more worried about the consequences because, again, Hebrew myth is one of crypsis and wandering. They're, they're the eternal suppliant. So, of course, Jacob resorts to deceit and deception as his tactic. And ultimately, Jacob acts righteously to protect his daughter's honor. It's the, and it's going to be the sons Levi and Simeon who will carry it out. They will leave. They will try to. They're going to leave Dina undefiled, right? Dina is Hera, this queen, and it's going to be done with a little bit of trickery, right, to give them the edge, this strategy. So from Genesis 34, then Shechem's father Hamor went out to talk with Jacob. Meanwhile, Jacob's son had come in from the fields. As soon as they heard what happened, they were shocked and furious because Shechem had done an outrageous thing in Israel by sleeping with Jacob's daughter, a thing that should not be done. Glory or Kleos was an important thing in the aristocratic society. you got to defend your family or defend the honor of your family, right? You do that through violence, and it's not always just in the most straightforward way. So, yes, the bravest and most furious warriors are the ones who quite literally will get the girls because <laughs> they're going to go out they're going to kill you if you get in their way and they're going to take the women that's how it, it doesn't may not seem fair but that's how an aristocratic society works the whole story of the iliad is one of Cleos and fighting over women right they go to war for helen and then achilles kind of goes over with agamemnon or enters into this huge negotiation for perseus and like mark mark brahman says like Religion and art are one, and they're a mating call, right? And the, the war cry is part of that for Ares. It's part of that mating call, and it's through this kleos, this, I don't know, imaginary or tangible thing that you can attain. So from the Iliad, book three. Meanwhile, Iris went to Helen in the form of her sister-in-law, wife of the son of Antenor, the fairest of Priam's daughter, she found her in her own room, working at a great web of purple linen on which she was embroidering the battles between the Trojans and Achaeans that Ares had made them fight for her sake. Iris then came up close to her and said, Come hither, child, and see the strange doings of the Trojans and Achaeans. Till now they have been warring upon the plain, mad with lust of battle, but now they have a left off fighting, and are leaning upon their shields, sitting still with their sp spears planted beside them. Alexandros and Menelaus are going to fight about yourself, and you are to Alexandros, wife of him, who is the victor. But the fighting, it's not just pure madness. There's going to be a strategy. But Ares himself is one of bloodthirstiness, right? He's the bloodthirsty, blood-curdling, uh, violent one. But he needs to be restrained and only unleashed by Athena. We're the best example, well, the, one of the best examples of Athena <laughs> going out and marshalling the troops is in book five of the Iliad with Diomedes when he he goes insane and he's led on by Hera and Athena and he injures Venus but also Ares right the god of war so this is let's read from Iliad book five then Pallas Athena put valor into the heart of Diomed son of Tydeus that he might excel all the other Argives and cover himself with glory she made a stream of fire flare from his shield and helmet like the star that shines most brilliantly in the summer after its bath in the waters of Oceanus. Even such a fire did she kindle upon his head and shoulders as she bade him speed into the thickest hurly-burly of the fight. And then going further into Book 5, Athena therefore took Ares by the hand and said, Ares, Ares, bane of man, blood-stained stormer of cities, 
May we not now leave the Trojans and Achaeans to fight it out and see to which of the two Zeus will vouchsafe the victory? Let us go away and thus avoid his anger. So saying, she drew Ares out of the battle and set him down upon the steep banks of the Scamander. Upon this, the Danaeans drove the Trojans back, and each one of their chieftains killed his man. Athena draws Ares out of the battle, and he's deposited on the banks of the Scamander. This is where I would argue we get the name Bank as the place of conducting financial transactions, where Bank derives its name for table. This is where we get the name Bank, and it becomes related to war through Athena, this drawing out of soldiers. And one way to draw out soldiers is in an aristocratic society is through Cl Kleos. Homer, Homer uses the word... Uh, Aoi for bank, as in, as in the bank of the Scamander, where Scamander is a river in Turkey. It's also where we get the name Meander from, right, to just kind of slowly work your way through the land. And this is also where we get the name Samoy, so right within Samoy we get Aoi. And perhaps the name Simeon is like the banks of the Scamander, or the Samoy, as in the Iliad, where the bodies pile up from the fury of Ares, and most famously from Diomedes in Book Five, but also Achilles at the end of the Iliad. And a bank or a table can be linked, again, with the snub nose of Simeon. It's like the shield wall of this flat table, right? This flat surface is the shield wall of Ares, or it's the snub nose of Simeon. It's also the bank. And book five, we also have the separation of Athena and Venus, where in the older myths, like the Sumerian mythos, you have this goddess uh, Inanna, who's the main goddess, incorporating both. Well, she like if you go onto Wikipedia, it's going to say that uh, Athena is like Inanna, or Inanna is kind of like Venus and Athena, and Athena, and I somewhat agree, because well, Inanna, yeah, she is one who has sex appeal, but she is also you know one of the wartime strategies is destroyer cities. Like that's like Athena, and it's not so much like Venus as as you find out in in the Iliad, but. Alongside with taking on the military strategy of Anana, she also incorporate Athena also incorporates the naval prowess, just ability to to go around on uh, boats, also the craftsmanship like weaving and stuff, but also social justice responsibilities, and uh, that makes her more like the Sumerian Nanche, right? So she's kind of a mix between yes Anana, but also somewhat like Nanche. So let's read further from Book Five of the Iliad. Thus he prayed, and Pallas Athena heard him. She made his limbs supple and quickened his hands and his feet. She then went up close to him and said, Fear not, Diomed, to do battle with the Trojans, for I have set in your heart the spirit of your knightly father, Tydeus. Moreover, I have withdrawn the veil from your eyes, that you know gods and men apart. If then any other god comes here and offers you battle, do not fight them. But should Zeus's daughter Venus come, strike her with your spear and wound her. When she had said this, Athena went away, and the son of Tydeus again took his place among the foremost fighters, three times more fierce even than he had been before. He was like a lion that some mountain shepherd has wounded, but not killed, as he is spring over the wall of a sheepyard to attack the sheep. The shepherd has roused the brute to a fury, but cannot defend his flock. So he takes shelter under the cover of the buildings, while the sheep, panic-stricken on being deserted, are smothered in heaps on one on top of the other, and the angry lion leaps out of, over the sheep ward sheep yard wall even thus did the di even thus did diomed go fiercely about among the trojans right so the bodies are being heaped up into piles similar to the measurement of homer but also in general a bank of a river it's basically it's a heap of material or it's material being pushed up by the river diomed looked angrily at him and answered Talk not of flight, for I shall not listen to you. I am of a race that knows neither flight nor fear, and my limbs are yet unwearied. I am in no mind to mount, but will go against them even as I am. Pallas Athena bids me be afraid of no man, and even though one of them escape, their steeds shall not take both back again. I say further and lay my saying to your heart, if Athena sees fit to vouchsafe me glory of killing both, stay your horses here and make the reins fast to the rim of the chariot. Then be sure you spring Aeneas's horses and drive them from the Trojan to the Achaean ranks. They are of the stock of that great 
Great Zeus gave to Tros in payment for his son Ganymede, and are the finest that live of move under the sun. King Anchises stole the blood by putting his bears to them without Laomedon's knowledge, and they bore him six foals. Four are still in his stables, but he gave the other two to Aeneas. We shall win great glory if we can take them. And Diomed shouted as he left her, Daughter of Zeus, leave war and battle alone. Can you not be contented with beguiling silly women? If you meddle with fighting, you will get what will make you shudder at the very name of war. Venus found fierce Ares waiting on the left of the battle with his spear and his two fleet steeds resting on a cloud. Whereon she fell on her knees before her brother and implored him to let her have his horses. Dear brother, Venus cried, save me and give me your horses to take me to Olympus, where the gods dwell. I am badly wounded by a mortal, the son of Tydeus, who would now fight even with the father Zeus. Thus she spoke, and Ares gave her his gold bedesined st steeds. And then even further into book five, bear it, my child, replied Dione, and make the best of it. We dwellers in Olympus have to put up with much at the hands of the men much at the hands of men, and we lay much suffering on one another. Ares had to suffer when Otis and Ephialtes, children of Aloeus, bound him in cruel bonds so that he lay thirteen months imprisoned in a vessel of bronze. Ares would have then perished had not th then fair Araboe, stepmother to the sons of Aloeus, told Hermes, who stole him away when he was already well hot, nigh worn out by the severity of his bondage. Hera again suffered when the mighty son of Amphitryon wounded her on the right breast with a three-barb arrow, and nothing could assuage her pain. So also did huge Hades when this same man, the son of ages bearing Zeus, hit him with an arrow even at the gates of hell and hurt him badly. Thereon Hades went to the house of Zeus on great Olympus, angry and full of pain, and the arrow on his brawny shoulder caused him great anguish till Paeon healed him by spreading smoothing air, by spreading soothing herbs on his wound, for Hades was not of mortal mold. Daring, headstrong, evildoer, her wrecked not of his sin and shooting to the gods that dwell in Olympus. And now Athena has egged his son on, has egged this son of Tadeus on against yourself, fool that he is not for reflecting that no man who fights with gods will live long or hear his children prattling about his knees when he returns from battle. Let then the son of Tydeus see, the, see that he does not have to fight with one who is stronger than you are. Then shall his brave wife daughter of Adrestus, rouse her whole house from his sleep, wailing for the loss of her wedded lord Diomed, the bravest of the Achaeans. So saying, she wiped the ichor from her wrist, her daughter. Ah, so saying, she wiped the ichor from the wrist of her daughter Venus with both hands, whereon the pain left her and her hand was healed. But Athena and Hera, who were looking on, began to taunt Zeus with their mocking talk, and Athena was first to speak. She said, Father Zeus, do not be angry with me. But I think the Cyprian must have been persuading some of the Achaean women to go with the Trojans, of whom she is very fond. And while caressing one or the other, them she must have torn her delicate hand with the golden pin of the woman's brooch. The sire of gods and men smiled and called golden Venus to, her, to his side. My child, said he, it has not been given to you to be the warrior. Attend henceforth to your own delightful matrimonial duties, and leave all this fighting to Ares and to Athena. The ending is the key, right? Where the goddess Venus is hurt in the fighting by Diomed, the son of Tydeus, and the mother tells her to leave the fighting to Air, or Zeus tells her to leave the fighting to Ares and Athena. So basically, that Venus or or Nana will become the goddess of love, and her role as a warrior goddess we, we associate also with Nana will be taken up by Athena in the Greek mythos. And we going further, we can associate an, Athena with Nana as well as the Sumerian goddess Nanche. And book six, uh, more there's in book six of the Iliad we there's more of the connection with Ares and Athena, and war, but also the the treasure and plunder one get one gets from war, and there's also the religious aspect that is more explicated in the book of Levictus, where it's kind of just well Levictus is it gives you like a rules, it's all set you know. When, these are the rules. The rules are this, blah, blah, blah. Whereas, you know, Homer, or the Iliad, it's a narrative. You don't really understand that you're learning the rules of something. It's just, you think you're hearing just this story. And and Levictus is all about washing the washing bodies and keeping clean while uh, being around corpses in general, right? It's about 
hygiene <laughs> and touching corpses, <laughs> which is like when you think about the Iliad, it's all about <laughs> going around. They go, go, they go drag around dead people. They re grab, they kill people. They also get blood all over themselves. They snatch armor off dead people. They go clean the dead people off after a war the next day, right? So you're kind of you're kind of learning about Levictus or the tradition of this Levictus, or maybe Levictus is because of <laughs> the Iliad, right? Because of all this death and destruction. So let's read Iliad, book six. Meanwhile, Nestor shouted to the Argives, saying, My friends, Danae warrior, servants of Ares, let no man lag that he may spoil the dead and bring back much booty to the ships. Let us kill as many as we can. The bodies will lie upon the plain, and you can despoil them later at your leisure. Athena, again, serves as the analogous figure to the Levites in the battle, where the Levites are the ones considered... Uh, they're, they're the ones who have the responsibility with keeping up the tabernacle and keeping it sacred. And they give the rules of washing, in particular the one of cleanliness, right? So Levictus is all about cleanliness and hygiene, and that is of most importance. And furthermore, they give the laws, like in Deuteronomy. Moses gives, gives you know, so Deuteronomy is just about giving the law. In Deuteronomy 21, there's the atonement for an unsolved murder. If someone is found slain, lying in the field in the land, the Lord, you're... God is giving you to possess, and it is not known who the killer was. Your elders and judges shall go out and measure the distance from the body to the neighboring towns. Then the elders of the town nearest the body shall take a heifer that has never been worked and has never worn a yoke and lead it down to a valley that has not been plowed or planted and where there is a flowing stream. There in the valley there that break the heifer's neck, the levictal, levictical priest shall step forward and for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister and to pronounce blessings in the name of the Lord and to decide all cases of dispute and assault. Then all the elders of the town nearest the body shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley, and shall they declare, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it done. Accept this atonement for your people in Israel, whom you have redeemed, Lord, and do not hold your people guilty of the blood of an innocent person. Then the bloodshed will be atoned for, and you will have not purged, and you will have purged from yourself the guilt of shedding innocent blood, since you have done what is right in the eyes of the Lord. So now I'll compare this to when Hector pranked a Zeus or God through Athena, uh, and but he can't do it directly, right? He has to he has to have the priestess of Athena do this since he is unclean, right? He's just killed someone, so he has has the women to do the prayers, right? Has, and I think that's why, right? Hence Athena is a woman because it's a martial society. So Iliad book six, and Hector answered. Honored mother, bring no wine, lest you unman me, and I forget my strength. I dare not make a drink offering to Zeus with unwashed hands. One who is bespattered with blood and filth may not pray to the son of Saturn. Get the matrons together and go with the offerings to the temple of Athena, driver of the spoil. There upon the knees of Athena lay the largest and fairest robe you have in your house. The one you set most store by promise, moreover, to sacrifice twelve yearling heifers to that have never felt the goad in the temple of the goddess. If we shall take pity on the town with the wives and little ones of the Trojans, and keep the son of Tydeus from from off the god, goodly city of uh, Ilias, for he fights with fury and fills men's souls with panic. Go then to the temple of Athena, while I seek Paris and extort him, or exhort him, if he will hear my words, with that the earth might open her jaws and swallow him, for Zeus bred him to be the bane of the Trojans and of Priam and Priam's sons. Could I be? See, could I but see him go down to the house of Hades, my heart would forget his heaviness. So Hector says that he wishes Zeus would cause the earth to swallow up uh, Paris, and much like God <laughs> causes the earth to open up and swallow the 250 people who rebelled against Aaron and Moses, and I think it's in Numbers 26. So I think the and then well, you got to be careful what you wish for, right? That <laughs> Hades, or Hector is the one who ends up getting killed. So, reading further, his mother went into the house and called her waiting woman who gathered the matrons throughout the city. She then went down into her fragrant storeroom where her embroidered robes were keep the work of the Sidonian women whom Alexandros had brought over from Sidon when he sailed the seas upon that voyage during which he carried off Helen. Hecuba took out the largest rope and the one that was most beautiful and rich with embroidery as an offering to Athena. It glittered like a star and lay at the very bottom of the chest. With this she went on her way, and many matrons went with her. When they reached the temple of Athena, lovely Theano, daughter of Syasius, and wife of Antinor, opened the doors for the Trojans. 
Open the doors, for the Trojans had made her priestess of Athena. The women lifted up their hands to the goddess with a loud cry, and Theano look, took the robe to lay it upon the knees of Athena, praying the while to the daughter of the great Zeus. Holy Athena, she cried, protect us of our city. Mighty goddess, break the spear of Diomed and lay him low before the Skaean gates. Do this, and we will sacrifice twelve heifers that we have that have never yet known the goad in your temple. If you will have, take pity upon the town with the wives and the little ones of the Trojans. Thus she prayed, and but Pallas Athena granted her not her prayer. <clears throat> In Greek myths, Athena is the strategic aspect of war within the Greek pantheon, much like in Genesis 34, where Jacob uh, uses strategy to slaughter the Hivites, right? So he also uses deceit to steal their cattle. And a good example of the strategy of Athena and the Levites in, in our popular culture uh, would, would be the movie 300, where the king Leonidas famously leads his men into the hot gates to take advantage of the geography to best utilize his phalanx, phalanxes against the Persians. Persians. So from Book Six of the Iliad, with these words of reasonable counsel, he persuaded he persuaded his brother. Whereon his squires gladly stripped the armor from off his shoulders. Then Nestor rose and spoke of a truth. Said he, "The Achaean land is fallen upon evil times." The old knight Peleus, counselor and orator among the Myr Myrmidons, loved when I was in his house to question me concerning the race and lineage of all the Argives. He would not grieve him. How would it not grieve him could he hear of them as now quailing before Hector? Many a time would he lift his hands in prayers that his soul might leave his body and go down within the house of Hades. Would by Father Zeus, Athena, and Apollo that I were still young and strong as when the Phapileans and the Arcadians were gathered in fight by the rapid river Saladon under the walls of Phaea, and round about the waters of the river Ladarnus. Godlike hero Erothalion stood forward as their champion with the armor of King Arethos. Upon his shoulders, Arethos, whom men and women had surnamed the Mace Man, because he fought neither with bow nor spear, but broke the battalions of the foe with his iron mace. Lysurgis killed him, not in a fair fight, but by entrapping him in a narrow way, where his mace served him not in no steed. For Lysurgis was too quick for him and speared him through the middle, so he fell to the earth on his back. Lycurgus then spoiled him of the armor, which Ares had given him, and bore it in battle thenceforward. But when he had grown old, grow, but when he had grew old and stayed at home, he gave it to his faithful squire, Eruathian, Eruthalian. Who in this same armor challenged the, mo the foremost men among us. The others quaked and quailed, but my high spirit bade me fight him through. Fight him, though none other would venture. I was the youngest man of them all, but when I fought him, Athena vouchsafed me victory. He was the biggest and strongest man that, I, uh, that ever I killed, and covered much ground as he lay sprawling upon the earth. Would that I were still young and strong as I then was, for the son of Priam would then soon find one who would face him. But you foremost among the whole host, though you be, have no, uh, uh, but you foremost among the whole, whole host, though you be, have none among you any stomach for fighting Hector. All right, so Nestor describes Lycur Lycurgus or Lycurgus, and Lycurgus is like Leonidas in that he fights in a tight space, and thus he kills. He kills the wild mace man Arethaos, Arethaus, a wild man with a huge hammer mace that he uses to like, clunk people over the head. And it, it's kind of like, well, it's like in the beginning of the, the movie Excalibur where people are just going around and just clunking people with their, their metal weapons. And it's just brutal. Or it could be like the movie 300, right? How Leonidas, he kills the wolf. In the beginning, by positioning himself between the two rocks, and then the wolf gets stuck, and then he stabs him in in the midsection with the the spear. Right? He's like Lycurgus or Lycurgus Leonidas. And in the Book of Numbers, there's the story of the talking ass of Balaam, where the donkey positions himself between two rocks, essentially blocking the way and injuring the leg of whoever intends to go around. And it reminds me of the phalanx in the hot gates again. This the movie Three Hundred, or or at least that's how I understand it. But we also understand donkeys as they're known to be stubborn, right? So it makes sense. But it, we can also think of it 
that they're kind of annoying, right? That <laughs> they're stubborn and they're annoying. That Leonidas, he's going to block the hot gates and it's going to be bad for if you want to go forward, right? If you're the Persians, it's going to be annoying that they get this kind of insufferable, this little insufferable obstacle keeps standing in your way. And it's like if you have martial law or if you have a phalanx, the weak link breaks the chain. You can't have, you can't have everyone, this a bunch of independent people and individuals. You have to have individuals that are willing to become the whole, right? And it's not just conservative. Conservative individualism is baked into it, right? It's like it's a bunch of individualist conservatism, unfortunately. So it's, you're never going to win anything with it because it's just a bunch of rebels. But liberalism can also be equally dumb and has a lot of rough edges that can't be smooth and that, that plenty of people are willing to make an ass of themselves over, right? There's a lot of loose ends. They're not a tight bundle at all, liberals. Iliad, Book 8. Athena answered, Would indeed this fellow might die in his own land and fall by the hands of the Achaeans, but my father Zeus is mad with spleen, ever foiling me, ever headstrong and unjust. He forgets how often I served his son when he was worn out by the labors Eurystheus Eurist had laid on him. He would weep till his cries came up to heaven, and then Zeus would send me down to help him if I had done... If I had the sense to foresee all this when Eurystheus sent him to the house of Hades to fetch the hell hound from Erebus, he would have never come back alive out of the deep waters of the river Styx, and now Zeus hates me. Well, he lets Thetis have her way because she kissed his knee and took hold of his beard when she was begging him to do honor to Achilles. I shall, shall know what to do next time he begins calling me his gray-eyed gray darling. Get our horses ready while I go within the house of ages bearing Zeus and put on my armor. We shall then find out whether Priam's son Hector will be glad to meet us in the highways of battle or whether the Trojans will glut hounds and vultures with the fat of their flesh as they lay dead by the ships of the Caians. Athena is the goddess of democracy, or we understand her as the goddess of democracy. and We can make an analogy to Levi, where Levi can be translated as the Greek verb demos, meaning people, which comes from the verb deo, meaning to bind. In the Greek world, a people would be considered a cluster of humans that were bound together, possibly by rules and laws, but also by identity and philosophies, right? How we know culture or ethnicity. It's quite likely that the much older name Levi expresses the same idea. Athena and women in general tend to be do more... Well, I think it, women... In, or this is kind of a generalization. Athena and women in general tend to do more administrative and housekeeping and service jobs, and nursing. There's a lot of in between jobs that keep society going. It's not that it's not important. It's they're very important. While men tend to do more powerful jobs, but also more dangerous jobs. Right? Men are more likely to die. Eh. But this this is kind of changing. This trend. There's like there's going to be more women truckers right in the future or something. Demos also means fat as well, right? So d democracy literally means to live off the fat of the land. It's like the power of fat. <laughs> America is powered by fat people. <laughs> Consumption. A similar attitude is expressed in Deuteronomy, I believe. To let passerbys you take just enough to eat, but not you can't harvest somebody else's uh, field. But you can, if you're passing by, you can eat enough to fill fill yourself for like a lunch or something essentially allow the vultures and hounds to live right the whole circle of life is needed and the bones will be picked dry and nothing is wasted it's the most efficient way athena is the one who draws out aries who comes and aries comes with panic strife and rout so basically if if there's going to be a rout and there's going to be a lot of panic well then there's going to be a lot of casualties but there's also going to be a lot of refugees or slaves that are going to be taken and Athena is kind of that nice face for that, right? That democracy is going to create a lot of slaves and refugees. It's going to create them as quickly as it can fly them over here or march them over the border. Going back to Genesis, Genesis 34 in particular, the Hivites ask the sons of Jacob to intermarry. And Jacob agrees, but he only agrees in deceit because Jacob doesn't want to give up his sister or give up the, the daughter, Dina, after her, her being defiled. And it could be that they don't want to give up the surgical and medicinal expertise, or they want to keep the Levites as this airless and magical priest, priest class. Or it could be like this kind of parable that's going to teach the importance of medicine and surgical arts when going to war. Like, well, they, 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 they are all 
hurting still after the circumcision. They haven't healed themselves. So they don't have any medicine, so they're more vulnerable. And likewise, in the Iliad, opiates and the ability to kill pain and heal quickly through medicine are important, right? It's an important craft. So from the Iliad, Book 5. He then bade Peon heal him, whereon Peon spread pain-killing herbs upon his wound and cured him, for he was not of mortal mold, as the juice of the fig tree curdles milk and thickens it in a moment, though it is liquid. Even so, instantly did Peon cure fierce Ares. Then he washed him and clothed him in goodly raiment and took his seat by his father Zeus, all glorious to behold. But Hera of Argos and Athena of all of Alalcomini, now that they had put a stop to the murderous doings of but Hera and Athena, now that they had put a stop to the murderous doings of Ares, went back again to the house of Zeus. So much how we think of the Hippocratic Oath, well, to do no harm, or basically do only good, is how we can think of, well, a surgeon in the Iliad or and like Genesis 34, where the, they're injured from the circumcision, and because they're injured, they're more easily susceptible to being killed in battle. So then, of course, right, a surgeon is worth more than an everyday soldier, right? The, it's the, Hippoc the Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> it's just kind of like this logical thing you can work through, right? That if a surgeon doesn't do any harm, well, then, therefore, he's going to be better than a soldier who is more of a liability. And the soldier is Ares, and Athena is the priestess of the state, and then the medicinal class is probably you know, who we know as Chiron, or maybe perhaps, better perhaps Asclepius. And Asclepius has a son who is mentioned in the Iliad. And symbol symbolically, 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 we can recognize it through the arrow in Sagittarius, right? And, and in Hebrew, it's through the tribe of Gad. So from the Iliad, Book 11. Hector did not yet know what Ajax was doing, for he was fighting on the extreme left of the battle by the banks of the river Scamander, where the carnage was thickest and the war cry loudest round Nestor and brave Idiomeneus. Among these, Hector was making great slaughter with his spear and furious driving and was destroying the ranks that were opposed to him. Still, though the Achaeans would have not given a, have, still the Achaeans would have give, given no ground had not Alexandros husband of love, lovely Helen stay the prowess of Helen stay the prowess of Machaon shepherd of his people by wounding him in the right shoulder with a triple barbed arrow the Achaeans were in great fear that as the fight had turned against them the Trojans might take him prisoner and Ideomanius said to Nestor Nestor son of Neleus honor to the Achaean name mount your chariot at once Take Machaon with you and drive your horses to the ships as fast as, as you can. A physician is worth more than several other men put together, for he can cut up arrows, for he can cut out arrows and spread healing herbs. Nestor, knight of Gerene, did as Idiomanius had counseled. He at once mounted his chariot, and Machaon, son, Machaon, son of the famed physician Asclepius, went with him. He lashed his horses, and they flew onward, nothing loth, towards the ship as though of their own free will. Thus then did they fight as it were a flaming fire. Meanwhile, the mares of Nellius, all in lather with sweat, were bearing Nestor out of the fight, and with him, Machaon, shepherd of his people. Again, this is important that a physician is worth more than several soldiers put together. Essentially, how we know the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm, but <laughs> it could also be like the Frankensteinian type of, uh, it could also be a Frankensteinian type of way of thinking. <laughs> if one is sinister enough, right, you could just like keep, <laughs> keep somebody alive or give them, drug them up enough or do some kind of <laughs> laboratory experiment in, in like a doctor, a doctor Frankenstein, right? <laughs> Later on in book 11 of the Iliad, Achilles comes out and he watches the battle and he's like the Pharaoh watching, or we can think of him as like the covenant and Hector he comes near the Greek camp Hector is like the ark so together they are like the ark of the covenant and Agamemnon he's like Agamemnon's like saying the tent of meeting right he's the tent of meeting or he's like Moses Agamemnon where Moses well he means to draw somebody out of the water and it's the ability to draw the troops in and out of the water or draw the ships in and out of the water Ultimately, it's the final say. He's the capital, right? Agamemnon is the capital. Moses is the capital. Reading from the Bible. In Numbers, in Numbers 10, it says, 
Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, Lord. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. Whenever it came to rest, he said, Return, Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. So when the ark the ark sets out, or Hector comes, right? Hector comes to the Achaean troops. Moses will say, Rise up, Lord. And it's likewise, it's Agamemnon sends out the troops, right? That Hector is threatening the, the, the Greeks, and then... Agamemnon has to send out the troops, and then Athena comes down and helps out the Greeks, and she's going to help scatter and disperse the Trojans on the plains of Troy. And this is, of course, has meaning with rivers and then depositing on the banks, as well as, you know, as well in other forms of myth, right? With Heracles, right? Where if you read the Iliad, it's not just about Achilles; they're also going to be learning about Heracles. Heracles' myth is all throughout the Iliad, and Heracles, of course, well, he's like Jacob. If you you can equate Heracles to the Hebrew Jacob. And where Jacob, well, Jacob is also another name for Israel, right? Israel is Jacob. I don't want to confuse too much, but Israel is the same as Jacob. So, like Heracles, well, in one of the tra- one of his labors, he unleashes the river Alphaeus and he cleans out the stables of Augeus. And it's like, well, uh, the- Athena is going to come down, but it's also others, right? Like Poseidon is going to come down. And he's going to scatter the Trojans too, as well, right? It's going to be like the river of the Alphaeus in Heracles. And there's, of course, Aaron, who is like Nestor, right? Nestor is like Aaron. So where Nestor, he prays uh, the hardest or the loudest, and he's the one who rallies the troops, the uh, nostalgia. And, and it's going, Hector comes closest to the tabernacle, or Hector comes closest to, to the ships of the Greeks. And, of course, again, Nestor is Aaron, where in the Bible, Aaron is the one who's allowed to go near the tabernacle, and he's also, or the tabernacles are the holiest of places, right? Because Aaron is a Levite. And Achilles, again, is like the Pharaoh, where he watches the Israelites crossing the Red Sea, but he doesn't go in himself, right? The Bible says that the Pharaoh doesn't go in. To, 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 you don't really know what happens to the Pharaoh. He just watches. <laughs> He's just like watching. Uh, from Book 11 of the Iliad, Achilles saw and took note for he was standing on the stern of his ship watching the hard stress and struggle of the fight. He called from the ship to his comrade Patroclus, who heard him in the tent and came out looking like Ares himself. Here, indeed, was the beginning of the ill that presently befell him why said he Achilles do you call me what do you want with me and Achilles answered noble son of Menoetius man after my own heart I take it that I shall now have the Achaeans praying at my knees for they are in great straits go Patroclus and ask Nestor who is that he is bearing away wounded from the field from his back I should say it was Machaon son of Asclepius but I could not see his face for the horses went by me at full speed Patroclus did as his dear comrade had bidden him, and set off running by the ships and tents of the Achaeans. When Nestor and Machaon had reached the tents of the sons of Nellius, they dismounted, and an, and an esqu- esquire, Eurymedon, took the horses from the chariot. The pair then stood in the breeze by the seaside to dry the sweat from their shirts, and when they had so done, they came inside and took their fair seats. Fair Hecamede, whom Nestor had awarded to him when Achilles took it, Mixed them a mess. She She was a daughter of wise Arsenas. And the Canes had given her to Nestor because he excelled all of them in counsel. First she set for them a fair and well made table that had the feet of Cyanus. On it there were several vessel of bronze and an onion to give relish to the drink with honey and cakes of barley meal. There was also a cup of a rare worksmanship which the old man had brought with him from home. Studded with bosses of gold, it had four handles on each of which there were two golden dubs feeding, and it had two feet to stand on. Anyone else would hardly have been able to lift it from the table when it was full, but Nestor could do so quite easily. In this, the woman, uh, as fair as a goddess, mixed them a mess with Permenian wine, she grated goat's milk cheese into it with a bronze grater, threw in a handful of white barley meal, and having thus prepared the mess, she bade them drink it. When they had done so, and had thus quenched their thirst, they fell talking with one another, and at this moment, Patroclus appeared at the door. So I'd imagine this is like in Exodus, where Aaron makes the golden calf for the Israelites, right? So Patroclus is like the golden calf, and this is all kind of going on when the Passover is also or after the Passover, and for the Israelites, and also, I'm sorry, when Moses is away on top of Mount Sinai, and we can also say, this is like in Numbers and Deuteronomy, when 
also the Passover is discussed, but it's also discussed for those who are going to be ceremonial, ceremonially unclean or foreigners, right? So Patroclus, he comes to the tent of Nestor, and he's like a foreigner. So in Numbers 9. But if anyone who is ceremonially clean and not on a journey fails to celebrate the Passover, they must be cut off from their people for not presenting the Lord's offering at the appointed time. They will bear the consequences of their sin. And in Numbers 14, a foreigner residing among you is also to celebrate the Lord's Passover in accordance with its rules and regulations. You must have the same regula regulations for both the foreigner and the native-born. And then reading further from the Iliad, When the old man saw him, he sprang from his seat, seized his hand, led him into the tent, and bade him take his place among them. But Patroclus stood where he was and said, Noble, noble sir, I may not stay. You cannot pers persuade me to come in. He that sent me is not one to be trifled with. He, he bade me ask who the wounded man was, whom you were bearing away from the field. I can, eat, can now see for myself that he is Machaon, shepherd of his people. I must go back and tell Achilles, you, sir, know what a terrible man he is and how ready to blame, even where no blame should lie. And Nestor answered, why should Achilles care to know who, how many of the Achaeans may be wounded? He recks not of the dismay that reigns in your our host, our most valiant chieftains lie disabled. Brave Diomed, son of Tydeus, is wounded. So are Odysseus and Agamemnon. Eurypylus has been hit with an arrow in the thigh, and I have just been bringing this man from the battlefield. He too wounded with an arrow. Nevertheless, Achilles, so valiant though he be, cares not, knows no ruth. Will he wait till the truth? Will he wait till the ships do what we may and are in the blaze, and per we perish upon one another? Once more, the importance of surgeons and the ability to heal people with medicine is stretched, right? Everybody is, at this point, everybody is hurt, right? Everybody's in the tent, and Patroclus is going to come out, but Patroclus is going to die, and then they're really going to need Achilles, right? Achilles is, he's the master negotiator, right? He knows his value. It, al it also could be that, like in the story in Genesis, Genesis 34, right? It's all kind of a, a ruse, <laughs> right? That uh, it's all done in deceit, right? That the... Once again, the important in medicine, everyone's kind of hurt. <laughs> Maybe they could be, you could say they've, they've been circumcised and all, they're all just hanging around. And this is the time they're also the most vulnerable. Uh, <clears throat> there could also be some more sim symbology or uh, there could be some kind of meaning with the, 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 the symbol of arrowheads. Nestor then tells a story of cattle rustling, which again is like Genesis 34. And that which is, again, like Genesis 34 in that Jacob and his sons, the Levites and the tribe of Simeon in particular, are the ones who steal from the Shechemites, right? When they were steal, he, they were still healing from their circumcision. Jacob says at the end of Genesis 34 that he's worried about becoming obnoxious to God. He's worrying about creating too big a wave after, right? So he's going to kill the Shechemites and steal all their 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 uh, cattle, but he has to do so in a kind of a clever, deceitful way because he's he's he doesn't want to make too big of a splash. There's going to be consequences to killing men and stealing and stealing their property, but you know there's ways to do it that are still good in the eye of God, right? Like I said, in an aristocratic society, <laughs> God is like going to be okay with you kind of killing people if it's done in a good way. With and it's through Athena, the the goddess. And uh, Ares, the god of war. So that medium, right, is where Athena and the Levites exist between God and human and upholding this kind of law. Athena is an atheist, right? She represents that medium between human and the goddess, but also the law of what, well, gods can't die, but humans can die. So killing a man and taking plunder uh, when it's war and when it isn't justified, it, it's the martial law. That's what Athena represents. Also, when Achilles comes out to watch, he sent Patroclus to find out how many people have died. And then Nestor, <laughs> he starts to clam up a little bit. He gets a little worried. He's like, how come Achilles wants to know how many are dead? Well, it's because there's a constant negotiation going on between Achilles and Agamemnon. And Nestor, he's kind of the middleman. He's worried that Achilles' value is going to go up too high. That right, All the, all the canes are going to get hurt. And then the Trojans are going to come burn down the ships of the Greeks. Or other way around that. He, Nestor is going to play this to his advantage, right? He's like, oh, my God, are we going to let the ships burn down? Oh, my God, when is Achilles going to come back? We need a, Achilles, right? We need this big warrior. Like, it's it's hot and cold, right? Like, sometimes the warrior is, is the bad guy, but sometimes the warrior is the good guy, right? The war is good. 
and 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 on the other side of that, Achilles is banking on the knowledge from Thetis, right? Thetis has sacrificed his, her child to Zeus or Moloch that he he's gonna die with much glory, and he has to wait though, right? He has to wait till the Trojans are about to burn down the ship when the the demand for Achilles is so high, right? There's no supply of heroes, right? Patroclus is dead. Then he's going to come out and he's going to collect the maximum amount of glory, the Kleos. Reading further into book 11 of the Iliad, Nestor goes over the story of how, well, how he stole the cattle, right? It's, again, reminiscent of the story in Genesis 34 where the brothers Levi and Simeon steal all the cattle and plunder the Hivites and kill their men, right? Because they're hurting because they've been circumcised. And likewise, in book 11, all the men are hurting Right, they're sitting in the tent. They're hurt. We can say they've. <laughs> it's kind of like the same thing. It's like a parable. So, Book Eleven of the Iliad. As for me, I have no strength nor stay in me any longer. Would that I were still young and strong as in the days when there was a fight between us and the men of Elias about some cattle raiding. I then killed Itomenius, uh, the valiant son of Hyperiochus, a dweller in Elias. And I was, I was driving in the spoil. He was hit by a dart thrown by my hand while fighting in the front rank in defense of his cows. So he fell, and the country people around him were in great fear. We drove off a vast quantity of booty from the field, 50 herds cattle and as many flocks of sheep, 50 droves also of pigs and as many wide-spreading flocks of goats. Of horses, more, moreover, we seized 150, all of them mares, and many had foals running around with them. All these did we drive by night to Pilus, the city of Nellius. Nellius, taking them with, then the city in the heart of Nellius was glad in that I had taken so much, though it was the first time I had ever been in the field. At daybreak the heralds went round crying that all in Elis, to whom there was a debt owing should come, and the leading Pileans assembled to divide the, spot, the spoils. There were many to whom the Paeans owed chattels, for we men of Pilus were few and had been oppressed with with wrong in former years Heracles had come and had laid his hand heavy upon us so that all our best men had perished Nellius had twelve sons but I alone was left the others had all been killed the Epeans presuming upon all this had looked down upon us and had done mu us much evil my father chose a herd of cattle and great flock of sheep three hundred in all and he took their shepherds with him for there was a great debt due to him in Elias to wit four horses winners of prize they and their chariots with him had gone to the games and were to run for a tripod, but King Aegeus took them and sent back their driver, grieving for the loss of their horses. Nellius was angered by what he but what he had both said and done, and took great value in return, but he divided the rest, that no man might have less than his full share. Thus did we order all things and offer sacrifices to the gods throughout the city, but three days afterwards the Epeans came in a but in a body, many in number, they and their chariots of full array, and with them the two Moliones and their armor, though they were still lads and unused unused to fighting. Now there is a certain town, Thraeosa, perched upon a rock on the river Alpheus, the border city Pylaeus. Pylus. This they would destroy and pitch their camp about it, but when they had crossed their whole plain, Athena darted down by night from Olympus and bade us set ourselves in array, and she found willing soldiers in Pylos, for the men... For the men meant fighting. Nellius would not let me arm and hid my horses, for he said that as yet I could know nothing about war. Nevertheless, Athena so ordered the fight at all, all on foot as I was. I fought among our mounted forces and vied with the foremost among them. There's a river that falls into the sea near Arian, Arene, and there they were mounted, and I with them waited till morning when the companies of foot soldiers, foot soldiers came up, up came up with us in force. Thence in full panoply and equipment we came towards noon to the sacred waters of the Alphaeus, and there we offered victims to Almighty Zeus with a bull to Alphaeus, another to Poseidon, and a hard heifer to Athena. After this we took supper in our companies and laid us down to rest, each in an armor by the river. The Epeans were beleaguering the city and were determined to take it, take it but ere this might be their... But ere this might be, there was a desperate fight in store for them. When the sun's rays began to fall down upon the earth, we joined battle, praying to Zeus and Athena. And we, when the fight had begun, I was the first to kill my man and take his horses, to wit the warrior Muleus. He was the son-in-law to Augeus, having married his eldest daughter, golden-haired Agamede, who knew the virtues of every herb which grows upon the face of the earth. 
I speared him as he was coming towards me. When he fell headlong in the dust, I sprang upon his chariot and took my, and took my place in the front ranks. The pains fled in all directions when they saw the captain of their horsemen, the best man they had, laid low, and I swept down on them like a whirlwind, taking fifty chariots, and each of them two men bit the dust, slain by my spear. I should have killed, even killed the two Molioni, sons of Actor, unless the real father, Poseidon, lord of the earthquake, had hidden them in a thick mist and borne them out of the fight. Thereon Zeus vouchsafed the Pylians a great victor for, victory, for we chased them far over the plain, killing the men and bringing in their armor, till we had brought our horses to Bar Baraspian, rich in wheat, into the Olanian rock, which with, with the hill that is called Ale Elysion, at which point uh, Athena turned the people back. There I slew the last men, and I left them. Then they came and drove the horses back from Baraspian to Pylos, and gave them thanks to Zeus among the gods and among mortal men to Nestor. Such was I among my peers as surely as ever was, but Achilles is for keeping all his valor for himself. Bitterly will he rue it a hereafter when the host is being cut to pieces. My good friend, did not Menoetius charge to you thus on the day that when he sent you from Thea to Agamemnon? Odysseus and I were in the house inside and heard all that he said to you, for we came to the fair house at Peleus while beating up recruits throughout all Achaia. And when we got there, we found Menoetius and yourself and Achilles with you. The old knight Peleus was in the outer court, roasting the fat, thigh-high bones of a heifer to Zeus, the lord of thunder. And he held a gold chalice in his hands, from which he poured drink offerings of wine over the burning sacrifice. You two were busy cutting up the heifer, and at that moment we stood at the gates, whereon Achilles sprang to his feet, led us by the hand into the house, placed us at table, and set before us such hospitable entertainment as guests expect. When we had satisfied herself with meat and drink, I said to my, I said my say and urged both of you to join us. You were ready enough to do so, and the two old men charged you much and straightly. Old Peleus bade his son Achilles fight ever among the foremost and out by his peers, while Menoetius, the son of Actor, spoke to, thus to you, said, My son, said he, Achilles is of no, nobler birth than you, but you are older than he. Though he is far the better man of the two, counsel him wisely, guide him in the right way, and he will follow you to his own profit. Thus did your father charge you, but you have forgotten, nevertheless, even now, say all this to Achilles. If he will listen to you, who knows, but with heaven's help you may talk him over, for it is good to take a friend's advice. If, however, his, he is fearful about some oracle, and for his mother has told him something from Zeus, then let him send you, and let the rest of the Marinans follow with you. If perchance you may bring light and saving to the Danaeans, and let him send you into battle, clad in his own armor, that the Trojans may mistake you for him and leave off fighting. The sons of the Achaeans may thus have time to get their breath, for they are hard-pressed, and there is little breathing time in battle. You, who are fresh, might easily drive a tired enemy back to his walls and away from the tents and ships. With these words, he moved the heart of Patroclus, who set off running by the line of the ships to Achilles, descending of Aeacus. When he had got as far as the ship of Odysseus, where was there a place of assembly and court of justice, with their altars dedicated to the gods, Eurypylus, son of Eumenon, went met him wounded in the thigh with an arrow, and leapt, limping out, out of the fight, sweet rain from his head and shoulders, and black blood welled from his cruel wound. But his mind did not wander. The son of Menoetius, when he saw him, had compassion upon him and spoke piously. O oh, unhappy princes and counselors of the Danaeans, are you then doomed to be feed to the hounds of Troy with your fat far from your friends in your native land? Say, noble Eurypylus, will the Achaeans be, held, be able to hold great Hector in check, or will they fall now before his spear? Wounded Eurypylus made answer, noble Patroclus, there is no hope left for the Achaeans, but they will perish at their ships. All that they were, princes among us, laying struck down and wounded at the hands of the Trojans, who are waxing stronger and stronger. But save me, and take me to your ship, cut out the arrow from my thigh, wash the black blood from it with warm water, and lay upon it those gracious herbs, which, so they say, have been shown by you, have been shown you by Achilles, who was himself shown them by Chiron, most righteous of all the centaurs, for of the physicians... Podalerius and Machaon, I hear that the one is is one that the one is lying wounded in his tent and is himself in need of healing, while the other is fighting the Trojans upon the plain. Hero Eurypylus replied, the brave son of Menoetius, 
how may these things be? What can I do? I am on my way to bear a message to noble Achilles from Nestor of Gerene, bulwark of the Kalians, but even so I will not be mindful to your distress. With this he clasped him around the middle and led him into the tent, and a, and a servant, when he saw him, spread bullock skins on the ground for him to lie on. He laid him at full length and cut out the sharp arrow from his thigh. He washed the black blood from the wound with warm water. He then crushed a bitter herb, rubbing it between his hands, and spread it upon the wound. This was a virtuous herb which killed all pain, so the wound presently dried and the blood left off flowing. Deuteronomy or numbers where you can't fight if you haven't loved a woman. And then it's like in the beginning of 300, where, or it's in like in 300 where the, uh, the guy, the son Ostinos or whatever, he's like wasn't going to be allowed to fight, but then the captain has like talked Leonidas into letting him go, right? That. You you achieve Kleos in this Hellenic or Greek society through fighting in war, right? And Achilles is shoved off to war by his his father, right? And you can juxtapose this with like I think it's again Deut Deuteronomy or Numbers where it's like uh, something similar, a little bit different, right? That you you can't leave go to war, right? Like you have to kind of spend some time at home before you go out to war uh, with your wife. And then again with Achilles. Uh, the Passover is discussed, and furthermore, there's also the bells or the silver trumpets to sound the start of a march, or to <clears throat> to bring all the soldiers in. Right, they get Agamemnon or Odysseus go around to gather troops, and Achilles is like one of the last people to gather, and it's like in Numbers ten, right, where the silver trumpets are the start of the march, and likewise, like Achilles was enticed into war and it's through said well it's through a couple of ways so some say that Odysseus blares a horn or something and then Achilles reacts to the sound and and he grabs like sword and a shield right like he's a soldier he was dressed as a woman <laughs> and then he kind of revealed himself as a man by going and grabbing like the sword or a shield reading further into the Iliad we have more description of the Phalanix and hoplites fighting of the style of the fighting style of the bronze age and into the Hellenistic Greeks. Uh, even the Romans used a similar method of fighting as described in the, in the Iliad and other mythos, right? Like, like I said, I think they quite literally took it to, as a interpreted, as a literal interpretation. So the Iliad, Book 13. Thus did the earth encircler address the Achaeans and urge them on. Thereon round the two Ajaxes there scattered strong bands of men, of whom not even Ares nor Athena, marshaller of hosts, could make light if they would went among them, for they were the most picked of man of all those who were now awaiting the onset of Hector and the Trojans. They made a living fence, spear to spear, shield to shield, buckler to buckler, helmet to helmet, and man to man. The horse hair crests on their gleaming helmets touched one another as they nodded forward. So closely selfied were there, the spears they brandished in their strong hands were interlaced, and their hearts were set on battle. Uh, there is another myth well, it's found within the Iliad, but it's also described by other mythographers. It is the myth of the twin sons, Ephaltes and Otis, right? the o Alouettes, which this describes the tying of war with banking, in my opinion, where Ares is said to be encased in bronze, where others say that he was just, in general, put in, in bonds where he couldn't escape. and Meaning, well, one, that he was financed right through bonds or money, right, the bronze, or it could just be literally that he, he was thought of as fighting encased in bronze, right? Like in the Bronze Age, they fought with armor, and <clears throat> it was like in this aristocratic form where <laughs> only the rich people could afford the metal, right? You couldn't, you, not everyone had their own smithy or they had access to a smithy and, and metals to make the, the armor and all that, or to pay for it at least. Whereas like eventually by the end of the Iliad, Right in the Odyssey, it's it's eventually what what's going to happen is that mercenaries take over. Right, it becomes a much more mercurial world. It's not an aristocratic world, and <clears throat> there's there's more to it. But first, let me read from the Apollodorus's Bibliotheca, as he explains the myth of the Alouettes. Where, but, but you could also find this in the in the Iliad. Caenus had by Poseidon, Hopeus and Nireus, and Epopeus, and Aloeus, and Triops. Aloeus wedded Iphimedia, 
daughter of Triops, but she fell in love with Poseidon, and often going to the sea, she would draw up the waves with her hands and pour them into her lap. Poseidon met her and begat two sons, Otis and Ephialtes, who are called the Alouids. These grow every year a cubit in breadth and a fathom in height, and when they were nine years old, being nine cubits broad and nine fathoms high, they resolved to fight against the gods, and they set Osa on Olympus, and having set Pelion on Osa, they threatened by means of these mountains to ascend up to heaven. And they said that by filling up the sea with the mountains, they could make it dry land, and the land they would make sea. And Ephialtes wooed Hera, and Otis wooed Artemis. Moreover, they put Ares in bonds. However, Hermes rescued Ares by stealth, and Artemis killed the Aloids and Naxo by a ruse, for she changed herself into a deer and leaped between them, and in their eagerness to hit the quarry, they threw their darts at each other. <clears throat> so the myth, it starts, goes, Canis had by Poseidon Hopleus, or I, you could say that, right, that Hopleus is like hoplites. It's the the noble men fight in the phalanx, right, the hoplites, with the three levels. So, right, the Romans fought with three levels. They have Nireus, Epopius, and Aloeus, and together, right, it's the triops, it's three eyes. Triops is literally three eyes. And that's not, maybe it's not the, the correct way to interpret it, right? <laughs> Perhaps, like, you could say, if you go in the Bible... And then you read Deuteronomy. Moses says you need to have three witnesses to accuse someone of a crime, right? To, to, to accuse someone, you would have three witnesses, that triops. And it's the law is, and it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's basically the law of Hammurabi, where I'd imagine it's kind of form of martial law, right? <clears throat> Hammurabi was an aristocratic warrior. So the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth is probably for the phalanx, where every man has to kind of uphold the the standard or a line in the eye for an eye, right? So it's a proportional law. So likewise, yeah, it's kind of brutal. You have to be able to accept the consequences. You have to, there's no weak links, right? You can't have any weak links. You can't. <laughs> so it's, it is what it is. Like, again, I said, Alexander probably would have liked the Deuteronomy or he could have wrote the Deuteronomy, like where the myth, it can be interpreted in the strict martial sense. Like, for example, Alexander, you fight with three masses, right? The, the left and the center and then the right. And then you have the phalanx shoulder to shoulder and you have multiple levels. And it, the Romans, similar in similar fashion, are a little different, but they have the same type of fighting, basically. And you also, they use siege equipment, which <clears throat> they have like skirmishers and all that stuff. If you read the Iliad, it's all in there, right? And they also, they use this siege equipment, which I'm, like siege towers, which in my opinion you could even interpret as the Alouids, right? The, the Alouids, within the myth of them, you could say that you tell the story of, like what, the siege of Tyre, right? When Alexander, he builds two siege towers to help build a causeway out to the city of Tyre, and then eventually he, he gives up on the siege to two siege towers, and then he sacks the city directly through this kind of amphibious assault, and he's on the wall at its weakest point. And Moreover, we can think of this through the Bible again. So it's with the the first Alouid, his name is Otis. It means insatiator. Probably you can say it's like a, a glutton, right? It's someone who's not ever satisfied. It's a glutton. And in Deuteronomy 21, you have, If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken on to them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on to him and bring him out unto the elders of the city and onto the gate of his palace. They shall... Say unto the elders of a city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our, our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And then all the men of his city shall city shall stone him with stones, and he that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. So the rebellious or gluttonous son is stoned to death. Where the stones are also symbolically associated with the Alouette, right, in the Greek myth. The myth, right, the stones are piled up or the mountains are piled up on top of each other. And the rebellious sons, the Alouids are trying to—they're <laughs> trying to take over Olympus, right? The father, or the the, the father of the gods, Zeus. They're trying to overthrow him. So a rebellious son can be, again, on either side of the political spectrum. But we we all know somebody who's not going to stop reacting to every bit of news. It's always for against red or blue, whatever it is. It's red or blue team. But you can't have that, obviously. <laughs> martial law. <laughs> like, if you people want the martial law, they're not. These people might not like it, right? <laughs> they might be the rebellious son. The other brother, Ephialtes, that most know of, or at least the name from the, they know Ephialtes from the name of the movie Three Hundred, 
right? He's the guy who who trade. He's the trader, but he's also the one. He has no. Sh- he has the weak shoulder, right? He's a weak arm. He's the weak link in the chain. And then, but in in the myth of the Alawite, well, Ephialtes, we could just take his name to mean fever, dream, or nightmare. That's how most people will translate it. And again, from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, the Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with a sore, and with a blasting, with mildew, that they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and thou shalt be removed into all kingdoms of the earth. <clears throat> so that's probably another way to look at kind of the, some part of the myth of the Alawites. It's, it's through Deuteronomy. And so looking further into the myth, we come to Artemis and her, her etymology. Well, the meaning of Artemis, you, we could say it comes the word artisan comes from artemis right artisan is like a to be seasoned seasoning or more more like correctly seasoning which probably means something like salt right salt is the the original seasoning and ephialtes well some people say he's like a fever dreamer or is like a nightmare ephialtes uh, it could be like upon the salt upon the salt or it could be mean quite literally like the covenant of the salt right and that well like in in the bible the, there's a covenant of the salt with Levictus, but also in, in reality, <laughs> we all have a covenant with salt. That one, if one eats carbs or grains, right? And then, well, if you're not eating like like uh, meats too, as well, if you if you don't eat enough meats, you'll need to eat salt for the iodine, or you'll have to get your iodine some way, and that's through salt or other minerals, right? Like people who just eat rice develop iodine deficiency. It's a really common deficiency. It's one of the most common health. Uh, problems with people across the world with people especially the people who have high diet or eat diets high in rice or just eat well they eat just rice they just basically just eat rice all day <laughs> the army and then most people already know this like the army in roman times was paid with salt right it's how we get the the the, the name salary is from salt and it was the levites in the bible who were the ones in charge of the sacrament of the salt where salt well, I think they say it's made by boiling the salt water or the seawater, and the salt is said to be holy because it, or special because it can survive the flame, right? The the salt remains after you boil away. Like if you just boil salt salt water, the salt's going to be there at the end. It's not going to just burn up, sublimate into the air. The Jewish the Jewish God Yahweh is the flame, right? They say it can survive the flame, the salt. The Levites are also the one in charge of the wave blessing, where the priests wave their hands. Over the sacrifices for a blessing, right? And likewise, Athena and all them, they have this, they carry around the Aegis, uh, like they're like Aegis bearing, and it has tassels on it, and they're also, it could quite literally mean like uh, somebody who bears something that shakes, or like this shaking device for shaking or waving, but it could li- translating to the one who can deliver the, the, the sacrifices of the wave, the waving, or that blessing. And going back to Artemis, yeah, you could say she's like artisan or salt seasoning, but you could also say she means the top sail of a boat, right? And that's well, that's going to come up a lot in the Odyssey, but also the Iliad. And thus we can read from the Iliad, if, like knowing all this uh, etymology. So the Iliad, book 15. The Trojans, fiercest lions, were still rushing on towards the ships in fulfillment of the, be- of the behest of Zeus, who kept spurring them on to now deeds of daring while he deadened the courage of the Argives and defeated them by encouraging the Trojans. For he f- meant giving glory to Hector, son of Priam, and letting him throw the fire upon the ships till he had fulfilled the unrighteous prayer that Thetis had made him Zeus. Therefore bided his time till he should see the glare of a blazing ship. From that hour he was about to so to order that the Trojans should be driven back from the ships and to vouchsafe glory to the Achaeans. With this purpose he inspired Hector, son of Priam, whose cager enough already to sail the ships his fury was that of Ares. or when a fire is raging in the glades of some dense forest upon the mountains he foamed out the mouth his eyes glared under his terrible eyebrows and his helmet quivered on his temples by reason of the fury with which he fought zeus from heaven was with him and though he was 
but won against his many, vouch vouchsafed him victory and glory, for he was doomed to an early death, and already Pallas Athena was hurrying on the hour of his destruction at the hands of the son of Peleus. Now, however, he kept trying to break the ranks of the enemy wherever he could see them thickest, and in the goodliest armor, but do what he might, he could not break through them, for they stood as a tower, four square, or some high cliff rising from the gray sea that braves the anger of the gale, and of the waves that thunder up against it. He fell upon them like flames of a fire from every quarter, and when a wave raised mountain high by wind and storm breaks over a ship and covers it in deep foam, the fierce winds roar against the mast. The hearts of the sailors fail them for fear, and they are saved, but but very but but by a very little from destruction. Even so were the hearts of the Achaeans fainting within them. Or as a savage lion attacking a herd of cows while they are feeding by thousands in the low-lying meadows by some wide watering shore, the herdsman is at his wit's ends how to protect his herd and keeps going about. Now in the van and now in the rear of his cattle while the lion s springs up into the thick of them and fastens on a cow so that they all tremble for fear. Even so were the Achaeans utterly panic-stricken by Hector and Father Zeus. Nevertheless, Hector, only Periphides, Periphides of Mycenae, he was son of Copraeus, who was wont, who was wont to take the orders of King Eurystheus to mighty Hercules. But the son was a far better man than the father in every way. He was fleet of foot, a valiant warrior, and an understanding ranked among the foremost men of Mycenae. He was. It, he it was who then afforded Hector a triumph, for as he was turning back, he stumbled against the rim of his shield, which reached his feet and served to keep the javelins off him. He stripped against this and fell forward, face, fell face forward, uh, f fell face upward. His helmet ringing loudly about his head as he did so. Hector saw him fall and ran up to him. He then thrust a spear into his chest and killed him close to his own comrades. These, for all their so sorrow, could not help him, for they were themselves terribly afraid of Hector. They had now reached the ships, and the prows of those that had been drawn up first were on every side of the ship, but the Trojans came pouring after them. The Argives were driven back from the first row of ships, but they made a stand by their tents without being broken up and scattered. Shame and fear restrained them. They kept shouting incessantly to one another, and then... In Nestor of Durin, tower of strength of the Achaeans, was loudest and imploring every man by his parents and beseeching him to stand firm. Be men, my friends, he cried, and respect one another's good opinion. Think all of you on your children, your wives, your property, and your parents, whether these be alive or dead. On their behalf, though they are not here, I implore you to stand firm and not to turn in flight. With these words, he put heart and soul into them all. Athena lifted the thick veil of darkness from their eyes, and they much Light fell up, much light fell upon them, unlike on the light, alike on the side of the ships and on where the flight was raging. They could see Hector and all his men, both these in the rear who were taking no part in the battle, and those who were fighting by the ships. Ajax could not bring himself to retreat along with the, the rest, but strode from the deck to deck, but strode deck from deck with a great sea pike in his hand, twelve cubits long, and he joined it with rings as a man skilled in feats of horsemanship couples four horses together and comes tearing full speed along the public way from the country into some large town. Many both men and women trap marvel as they see him, for he keeps all the time changing his horse, springing from one to the other, without ever missing missing his feet while the horses are at a gallop. Even so did Ajax go striding from one ship's deck to another, and his voice went up into the heavens. He kept shouting his orders to the Danaeans and exhorting them to defend their ships and their tents. Neither did Hector remain within the body of the Trojans, of the Trojan warriors, but as a dun eagle swoops down upon a flock of wildfowl feeding near a river geese, it may be or cranes or long-necked swans, even so did Hector make for a straight for the dark, proud ship, rushing right towards it. For Zeus, with his mighty hand, impelled him forward and roused him, and roused his people to follow him. And now the battle again raged fiercely at the ships. You would have thought that the men were coming on fresh and unwary. So fiercely did they fight, and this was in the mind in which they were. The Canes did not believe that they should escape destruction, but thought doomed themselves. While there was not a Trojan, but had, but his heart beat high with the hopes of firing the ships and putting the Canes' heroes to the sword. Thus were the two sides minded. Then Hector seized the stern of the good ship that had brought Protesilus to Troy, but never brought bore him back to his native land. 
Round the ship there raged a close hand-to-hand -hand fight between the Danaeans and Trojans. They did not fight at a distance with bows and javelins, but with one mind hacked at one another in close combat with their mighty swords and spears pointed at both ends. They fought moreover with keen battle axes and with hatchets. Many a good stout blade hilted and scabbard with iron fell from hand or shoulder as they fought, and the earth ran red with blood. Hector, when he had seized the ship, would not lose his hold, but held on to its curved stern and shouted to the Trojans, Bring fire and raise the battle cry, all of you, with a single voice. Now has v Zeus vouchsafed us a day that will pray for the rest of our lives. This day we shall take the ships which came hither against heaven's will and which have caused us an infinite suffering through the cowardice of our counselors. Who, when I would have went done to battle at the ships, who, when I would have done battle at the ships, held me back and forbade the host to follow me? If Zeus then indeed warp our judgments, himself now commands me and cheers me on. As he spoke thus, the Trojans sprang yet more fiercely on the Achaeans, and Ajax no longer held his ground, for he was overcome by the darts that were flung at him and made sure that he was doomed. Therefore, he left the raised deck at the stern and stepped back onto the seven-foot bench of the oarsmen. Here he stood on the lookout and with his spear, held back Trojans, whom he saw bringing fire to the ships. All the time he kept on shouting at the top of his voice and exhorting the Danaeans. My friends, he cried, Danaean heroes, servants of Ares, be men, my friends, and fight with might and main. Can we hope to find helpers hereafter or a wall to shield us more surely than the one we have? There is no strong city within reach whence we may draw fresh forces to turn the scales in our favor. We are on the plain of the armed Trojans with the sea behind us and far from our own country. Our salvation, therefore, is in the might of our hands and in hard fighting. As he spoke, he wielded his spear with great fury, and when any Trojan made towards the ship with a fire at Hector's bidding, he would be on the lookout for him and drive at him with his long spear, twelve men that he does kill in hand-to-hand -hand fight before the ships. <clears throat> so, comparing the myth of the Alawites to the Bible, we can look at the book of Genesis again, and in particular that of uh, Genesis chapters 37 through 42, where it's Simeon who is bound by Joseph, right? So when the brothers go to Egypt, when after they have sold, they already sold Joseph on into captivity, and Joseph is in Egypt, and then Jacob sends the brothers to Egypt. Um, Joseph he puts Simeon in bounds, right? And it's like Simeon again is like Ares, and then Joseph is like Mercury or he's like Hermes, and then so. Simeon is in bounds, and then he has to wait for Jacob to come to Egypt. And then once Jacob's there, he's released from his bonds. And then thus the tribes of Israel are, uh, are going to be spread out, all right? The, the, the tribes of Israel are going to be dispersed, right, out of Egypt. And it's because of, once again, it's Jacob goes to Egypt. And then eventually they end up right in Canaan. But that doesn't happen later until the end of Deuteronomy and into the book of Joshua. And Joseph, of course, is able to see dreams, and he's allowed to be a prophet by the pharaohs as long as he's right. And Joseph was able to predict the seven years of blessings and then the seven years of curses. And again, this is like Deuteronomy. Uh, and then likewise, it's like Achilles in the Iliad, who's he's like on the banks of the the. He's like on the banks of the. And likewise, it's Achilles. He he's he's like a, the pharaoh, and then he's on the banks of the. The river, and he's watching, right? And then he's he's gonna wait for the rising of the dog star to finally take battle, right? And he's gonna take battle as the brightest star in the sky, and he's gonna get the maximum amount of value or Kleos, and he'll he'll also eventually let Priam take Hector's body to escape the bounds that uh, Achilles put him in, right? Because Achilles ties him up when he drags him around the city, and then Priam comes and gets him. And of course, Priam was guided by Hermes, right? So it's like the myth of the Alouettes, and it's also like Genesis 37 again, where uh, Simeon is put into bounds by Joseph, right? And then he's allowed out. Eventually, eventually everyone in the Iliad is, or what the story of the Iliad is, is that it becomes like a, a war of mercenaries, or war becomes that of, like, uh, <laughs> pirates. <laughs> or like, you could say the whole thing is like pirates, but eh, there is some aristocratic thing, uh, sensibility to it. But once you get into the Odyssey, right, the, the Odyssey sense is like a mercurial world. Reading from the Iliad, Book 19. Then Achilles went out upon the seashore and with a loud cry called on the Achaean heroes. On this, even though those who had 
who as yet had stayed always at the ships, the pilots and helmsmen, even the stewards who were about the ships and served out rations, all came to the place of assembly because Achilles had showed himself after having held aloof so long from fighting. Two sons of Mars, or Ares, sorry, two sons of Ares, Odysseus and the son of Tydeus, came limping from their wounds, still paying them. Nevertheless, they came and took their seats in the front row of the assembly. Last of all came Agamemnon, king of men. He too wounded, for Coon, son of Antenor, had struck him with a spear in battle. When the Achaeans were got together, Achilles rose and said, Son of Atreus, surely it would have been better alike for both you and me when we too were in such high anger about Perse. Surely it would have been better. But Artemis's arrow slain her at the ship on the day when I took her after having sacked Larnessus. For now, for so many an Achaean the less would have been bitten dust before the foe in the days of my anger. It has been well for Hector and the Trojans, but the Achaeans will long indeed remember our quarrel. Now, however, let it be, for it is over. If we have been angry, necessity has schooled our anger. I put it from me, I put it from me, I dare not nurse it forever. Therefore, bid the Achaeans arm forthwith, forthwith I, that I may go out against the Trojans and learn whether they will be in mind to sleep by the ships or no. Glad, I ween, will he be to rest his knees, or whom may f fly my spear when I wield it. Thus did he speak, and the Achaeans rejoiced in that he had put away his anger. Then Agamemnon spoke, rising in his place, and not going into the middle of the assembly. Danaean heroes, said he, servants of Ares, it is well to listen to a man. It is well to listen when a man stands up to speak, and is not seemly to interrupt him, or it will go hard, even with a practiced speaker. Who can either hear or speak in an uproar? Even the finest orator will be disconcerted by it. I will expound to the son of Peleus. And do you other Achaeans heed me and mark me well? Often have the Achaeans spoke to me of this matter and upbraided me, but it was not I that did it. Zeus and fate and the Arenes that walk in the darkness struck me mad when we were assembled on that day that I took from Achilles the mead that had been awarded to him. What could I do? All things are in the hand of heaven. And folly, eldest of Zeus's daughters, shut my eyes to their destruction. She walks delicately, not on the solid earth, but hovers over the heads of men to take me, to make them stumble or to ensnare them. So, yeah, this is important. Agamemnon says, says to listen to Achilles and that the servants of Ares should listen to a well-spoken man, right? It's important to listen. It's important to hear. It's, of course, easier said than done, like uh, everything in life. But sometimes, yes, sometimes you need to calm down and best to listen and not just say or react to anything, right? That the Superman requires some discretion and discipline, right? And as well, maybe some crypsis, right? Because, <laughs> well, for, for one, that's his... his uh, the crypts or the absence are like kryptonite that once you've kind of discovered the kryptonite or you've discovered the crypts, well, that's the end of Superman, right? That you can't reveal yourself. We have to be in society, but you can't <laughs> You can't just be this like uh, react to everything, right? Then that's, that's a good way to identify yourself to the market or to the whatever system that you were supposedly rebelling against, right? But in reality, you're keeping it going by. It's Achilles, the ultimate martial figure right that yes diomedes in book five he's kind of like leonidas he has like this huge uh moment of glory but it's ultimately it's achilles that's like the martial figure uh or he's like most like Ares. but you could say that everyone is like Ares is kind of a god that maybe well maybe people understand so they don't really think about him that well right that we just understand him as like this like soldier we know what exactly what a soldier is and what entails a soldier we know all the myths of soldiers everyone loves war movies we know exactly what a uh a superman or a, a martial figure is supposed to be like right so it's not a big not necessarily anything crazy right or that you've never thought about but in a sense when he gets down to it, Achilles, yes, he's he's a lot of things, right? But he is like the ultimate warrior, right? <laughs> he's the marshal. From the Iliad, book 20. So long as the gods held themselves aloof from, mar from mortal warriors, the Achaeans were triumphant, for Achilles, who had long refused to fight, was now with them. There was not a Trojan, but his limbs failed him for fear as he beheld the fleet son of Peleus, all glorious in his armor and looking like Ares himself. When, however, the Olympians came to take their part among them, forthwith arose strong strife, rouser of host, and Athena raised her loud voice, now standing by the deep trench that ran outside the wall, and now shouting with all her might upon the shore of the sounding sea. Ares also bellowed out upon the other side, dark as some black thunder cloud, and called on to the Trojans at the top of his voice, now from the Acropolis, and now speeding up to the side of the river Samois, till he came to the hill. 
And Achilles an or and Aeneas answered, Why do you why do you bid me fight the proud son of Peleus when I am in no mind to do so? Were I to face him now, it would be not be for the first time. His spear has already put me to right from Ida when he attacked our cattle and sacked Larnessus Larnessus and Pedasus. Zeus indeed saved me in that vouchsafed me strength to fly, or else I had been fallen by the hands of Achilles and Athena, who went before him to protect him and urge him to fall upon the Trojans. No man may fight Achilles, for one of the gods is always with him as the guardian angel. And even were it not so, his weapons flies ever straight and fails not to pierce the flesh of him who is against him. If heaven would let me fight him on even terms, he should not overcome me, though he boasts that he is made of bronze. Right, so he's made of bronze. He's like he's like Ares, right? <laughs> Everything about him is like Ares. He sprang forward along the line and cheered his men on as he did so. Let not the Trojans, he cried, keep you at arm's length, the Achaeans, but go for them and fight them man for man. However valiant I may be, I cannot give chase to so many and fight all of them. Even Ares, who is immortal, or Athena, would shrink from flinging himself into the jaws of such a flight, or such a fight and laying about him, nevertheless, so far as me and lies. I will show no slackness of hand or foot, nor one of endurance. Not even for a moment I will utterly break their ranks, and woe to the Trojans who shall venture within the reach of my spear. And then further, as a fire raging in some mountain glen after a long drought, and the dense forest is in a blaze, while the wind carries great tongues of fire in every direction, even so fiercely did Achilles rage, wielding his spear as though he were a god, and giving chase to those whom he would slay, till the dark earth ran with blood, or as one who yokes broad <clears throat> broad-browed oxen though that they may tread barley in a threshing floor and it is soon bruised under small bruised small under the feet of the lowing cattle even so did the horses of achilles trample on the shields and bodies of the slain the axle underneath and the railing that ran around the car were bespattered with clots of blood thrown up by the horses hoofs and from the tires of the wheels but the son of peleus pressed on to win still further glory and his hands were bedabbled or bedrapped with gore and then moving into the Book 22 of the Iliad. Thus did he stand and ponder, but Achilles came up to him as it were Ares himself, plumed lord of battle from his right shoulder. He brandished his terrible spear of Pelion ash, and the bronze gleamed around him like a flashing of fire or the rays of the ri rising sun. Fear fell upon Hector as he beheld him, and he dared not stay longer where he was, but fled in dismay from before the gates, while Achilles darted after him at his utmost speed. As a mountain falcon, as a mountain falcon swift as of all birds, swoops down upon some cowering dove. The dove flies before him, but the falcon, with a shrill scream, falls close after, resolved to have her. Even so did Achilles make straight for Hector with all his might, while Hector fled under the Trojan wall as fast as his limbs could take him. <clears throat> and then going back to in uh, Genesis, uh, Genesis 34, so the name Hamor means the red one, to begin to flow slowly too, right? So it also means like the metal that has become hot with fire it also means like the the rising of the sun and then like p grapes too right that are red right so like <laughs> he's like on the threshing floor he's like crushing the grapes there's a lot of red symbology a lot of symbology we can associate with like, Aries, but also with um homor and like the the tales of uh simeon and Lev levi moving along zeus agrees to allow the body of hector to be stolen and it's of course Hermes that is going to steal him back, right? He, and that uh, Achilles is going to accept the ransom from Priam, and that this is kind of like, again, the myth of the Alouettes. And it's also like many things in the Bible and other Greek myths. So one where Ares is trapped in bronze, and it's Hermes, again, who's going to help him escape, which you could say happens in Book 24 of the Iliad, essentially, where Hermes helps Priam ransom the body of Hector so that he can reclaim the body of Hector, or, you know, reclaim the body of his son and give him his proper funeral rites. And it's because Apollo, right? Apollo asks for Hector to, to be allowed some uh, some pity from uh, from Achilles. So Apollo allows for redemption, right? And uh, Apollo, for those who, who can afford it, you can pay redemption in silver, right? The Apollonian kind of the, the, the silver, the legal, legal tender. But there's also other ways you can do it too, right? That you can uh, sacrifice animals and such in order to pay for your redemption. And <clears throat> so Hermes comes down and he helps protect, or Apollo also helps protect Hector, right? And doesn't allow him to spoil in the heat and allows his body, doesn't allow his body to be damaged while it's being dragged by Achilles. And 
I think that probably also has something to do with redemption as well, and that you don't when you sacrifice a body that it has to be like a uh, oxen or a ram, it has to be unblemished, right? Also, in the book of Genesis, it's Joseph that ties Simeon up, right? Joseph ties Simeon up and eventually lets him go, and he reunites, reunites him with his family. And we can think of Simeon as Arion and Joseph as Hermes. And, uh, well, all right. And go, so from the last book of the Iliad, Iliad, book 24, Thus shamefully did Achilles in his fury dishonor Hector. But the blessed gods looked down in pity from heaven and urged Hermes, slayer of Argus, to steal the body. All were of this mind, save only Hera, Poseidon, and Zeus's gray-eyed daughter, who persisted in the hate which they had ever borne towards Ilias with Priam and his people, for they forgave not the wrong done them by Alexandros in disdaining the goddesses who came to him when he was in his sheepyards, and preferring her who had preferred him a wanton to his ruin. When, therefore, the morning of the twelfth they had come, now come, Phoebus Apollo spoke among the mortals, saying, You gods ought to be ashamed of yourselves. You are cruel and hard-hearted. Did not Hector burn you thigh bones of heifers and of unblemished goats? And now you dare not rescue even his dead body for his wife to look upon him with his mother and child, his father Priam and his people, who would forthwith commit him to the flames and give him his due funeral rites. So then you would all be on the side of mad Achilles, who knows neither right nor ruth. He is like some savage lion that is in the pride of his great strength and daring springs upon men's flocks and gorges on them even so has achilles flung aside all pity and all that conscience which at once so greatly banes yet greatly boons him that he will heed it may man may man may lose one far dearer than achilles has lost a son it may be or a brother born from his mother's own wound yet when he has mourned him and wept over him he will let him bide for it takes much sorrow to kill a man Whereas Achilles, now that he has slain noble Hector, drags him behind his chariot round the whole tomb of his comrade. It were better of him, and it, it were better of him and for him that he should not do so. For brave though he would be of the gods, may take it ill that he should vent his fury upon dead clay. Then said Zeus, "Here be not so bitter." Ah, uh, then said Zeus, "Hera, be not so bitter. Their honor shall not be equal. But of all that dwell in Ilius." Hector was dearest to the gods, and also to myself, for his offerings never failed me. Never was my altar stinted of its dues, nor the drink offerings and savor of sacrifice, which we claim of right. I shall therefore permit the body of mighty Hector to be stolen, and yet this may, and yet this may hardly be without Achilles coming to know it, for his mother keeps night and day beside him. Let some of you, let some one of you therefore send Thetis to me, and I will impart my counsel to her, namely, namely that Achilles is to accept a ransom from Priam and give up the body. Right? So then so then Athetis goes down and finds Achilles and he's he's eating his breakfast. It's a woolly ram where breakfast is breakfast is or the morning meal is a Arius stone and then ram is similar word to Aries again where it's ram is Aram Aram and then likewise army or chariots is Armata, right? And then also shoulder or arm is armos. <laughs> right, so all these words kind of mean the same, right? That the root is from Ares. And they all kind of are told, right? They're told through the story of the Iliad as well, right? The story of the Iliad is essentially a story of Ares or the martial well. It might, you might not think it. You think of it as all these other gods. But in reality, <laughs> it's kind of, if you take it quite literally, it is a story of Ares. So it's a study, story of a martial law. And how it ends... It ends in book 24, the last book of the Iliad, right? Achilles agrees to release Hector, and Ares escapes his bonds with help from Hermes.